Well, thank you. I think we will get started. I will call the meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. Um, I will start by uh, observing that uh, we have two members of the council who are here remotely only. So I'd ask them to uh, introduce themselves. Sal, you want to start? Alfano, uh, District uh, 2, two Council of Africa. And Hi, everyone. Helen Cohn, District 2 City Council. Okay, thank you. Um, this is our uh, first night in the uh, in the library of Montpelier High School, and I want to uh, thank the uh, Montpelier Roxbury Public School District and the administration to for their uh, efforts in accommodating us. And uh, this is where we'll be for the foreseeable future until we can uh, be back in our home base. And I really, really appreciate our being able to do this. Um, I'll mention a few uh, logistics. Anyone who's joining remotely, if you'd like to participate, uh, we're, ha we're happy to have you participate. Please uh, connect on uh, to our uh, to our computer to our uh, Zoom meeting and indicate change your name on display to your name and uh, so we'll know who's here and who we're uh, recognizing. Um, anyone who wants to be recognized, uh, raise your hand either physically or preferably on the on the screen and we will call on you i try to call on people in the order in which they raise their hands and if if i miss somebody uh please let me know that, I, that i'm doing that uh, we ask you all to keep your comments and questions to three minutes and uh, if you speak out of turn exceed your time or uh, Go on too long, you may be interrupted. And uh, for, for all of our timekeeping functions, we rely on Councillor Bate as a timekeeper. Um, first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. And is there anyone on the council who wishes to uh, make any changes to the agenda? Okay, you consider the agenda to be approved. Next, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic which is not on tonight's agenda. You can be recognized in the method I mentioned earlier, and please limit your comments or questions to three minutes. Okay, I am not seeing anyone. So next up we have uh, the consent agenda, which is a topic of, which is generally topics that are believed to be uh, uncontroversial and not requiring a uh, full uh, council discussion. I, uh, we had some questions raised about items on the consent agenda. And uh, I believe we still have a request to take D and E off the consent agenda. Is that correct, Sal? I think uh, item item D only, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So the consent agenda is before before us, and I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item D. Second. Any discussion? Are you about to say that people need to talk a lot louder, Donna? I'm sorry, I'm just having a hard time getting connected. Oh, you're still not connected. Yeah, so I'm here. Oh, but well, let's, let's wait. Neither my iPad nor my computer down. wants to do it. Oh, I, I got. I oh, no. Do you need to get on the network? It's. Uh, Don't let me hold you up. Okay. I'm here. I'm all those on. on the consent agenda, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? All right, we have adopted the consent agenda with the exception of item D. And let's move right into item D, which is the waiver of permit fees for flood, flood related projects. You want to kick that off, Sal? Yeah, thanks. Um, so my my question was um, whether or not FEMA would reimburse uh, permit fees, and if they would, why should we waive them, uh, given the fact that uh, you know re revenue sources are, are down? It wasn't something we discussed when we initially. Um, talked about this topic. Uh, so I, is, is have we determined FEMA's policy with regard to permits, permit fees? Yes, we have. Sorry, shouldn't have muted, unmuted. Uh, yes, we have. Um, I thought I'd sent that out. Yeah, they do not reimburse for this, for lost revenue. And I think part of the question was, I followed up with Sal, if, uh, if a property owner were required to pay a fee, is that something that would be eligible to, to have FEMA pay the pop property owner back? We don't, I don't think we know about that. That's a different FEMA program. I know for, for governments, we they don't they don't reimburse lost revenue. Um, I don't know if that would be considered part of the project cost for the property. Okay. So the fee, I mean, we're waiving the fees for every everybody, right? So for, for residents, so it would be a reimbursable cost to the resident. That was my question. If if they'll if they'll reimburse it, why not why not charge it? And, and we don't know the answer to that, whether we don't know from the resident. We know they don't want reimburse the city for lost revenue. We don't know if they would reimburse the resident as that being a cost of I mean, maybe they would, maybe they would. we don't have the answer. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question on that. Mm. I thought you were asking whether they would reimburse the city for lost revenue. And we had voted to continue until tonight. Suspend, and tonight was la is the last tonight night, right? It's actually tomorrow. So, but, so you got to you've got to act, if at all, uh, tonight. You could extend it till the 27th and get the answer. Uh -huh. If that's what you'd like to do. What's your pleasure, folks? Tim? I'd move that we extend it to the 27th. Okay, is there a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Any discussion? I'd like to hear the motion. Out, uh, there's a air filter behind me as well as a phone. Yes, we can move to extend the deadline for the permit application fee waiver until Fees. September 27th. Okay. To continue the waiver till the next meeting. We're going to continue to waiver. Great. Thank you. Any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We have done that, and hopefully we'll have an answer by our next meeting. Thanks, Sal. Okay. We Next, we have... Uh, number of appointments. We have appointments for the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee and the Design Review Committee. So let's see if any of those applicants are here. If you are, before I scroll down to uh, the bottom of the list, you should feel free to raise your hand. or yell out. I don't see any of the applicants here. Um, <clears throat> so what would you like to do? We could, uh, we could, but are not required to go into executive session. Or we could uh, entertain a motion to approve the candidates without going into it. Yes. So I move we appoint Rebecca Coleman to the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, and we reappoint Stephen Everett and Eric Gilbertson to the Design Review Committee. Second. Is there any discussion? Tim? Just to acknowledge Stephen and Eric's 
amazing contribution over a very long time in this committee. And they I, I appear before that committee once in a while. I have to say it has evolved to becoming, it's a really good productive committee, thanks to their efforts. So. It's really great to have people who come out, learn the material, especially for an important committee like that. So yeah, I agree. Thank you. Ready for the vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I think that gets us to uh, to the main topic of tonight, the Country Club Road Workshop. Um, we have uh, been talking about Country Club Road for a long time, and uh, Councillor uh, Heaney has pointed out that we haven't really had a chance to talk about the whole, the general, all the ideas, the merits of the idea, and where we're going with it as a council. And so that's what the purpose of uh, of putting it on for tonight is. And uh, are you kicking it off, Phil? Sure, I will. But we do have uh, staff here, both in person and remotely. Uh, so there are really five aspects. Um, it's kind of like five sub agenda items that got laid out for you. The first is, I think, the big one: the workshop discussion that we had originally planned pre-flood. Uh, just a discussion about the overall plan. I think, from the city's perspective, we we had the actionable master plan, or whatever we ended up calling it. And it laid out a concept for the site and laid out a bunch of steps that need to happen to, to make that happen. And, uh, you know, the sooner we can settle on at least the, the areas where the housing and the rec are going to be, the sooner we can start moving those forward, understanding that we're not committing funds or making final commitments. Um, and so I think that's the, the big discussion that you all want to have about the sort of philosophy behind this, this project. Um, the second is then if, if, Assuming that the layout stays about the same, we'd like to get started on, on a project. We'd like to kick off the recreation area planning. Uh, we, we've set aside an area but theoretically for recreation. What would that look like? Would there be a facility? What would be on it? What would be included? What would the cost? How would that work? You know, start. We have uh, the Ballard and King analysis almost. We'll have that for a future meeting to present. Uh, it's uh, just being finalized now, but it, it, we're getting that work. So, uh, probably most immediate before us is the topic of uh, potential FEMA housing going there. They're very interested in locating uh, uh, thirty up to 36 uh, transitional trailers that will be there for 18 to 24 months. Um, they've been very cooperative. We've been uh, actually... Uh, Doug is here from the... Doug Farnham is here from the governor's office to weigh in from their perspective on this, if, if you'd like. Um, we are. Uh, we had suggested to them that they locate these trailers in the area of what had been identified as the first housing pod, and they're agreeable to that. So they would bring infrastructure into that area. We're negotiating with them about possibly upsizing the water line, uh, the length of that road, because it would be necessary for hydrant. So we could, you know, this could be one of these things where um, we. We provide necessary housing to people who are without housing right now because of the flood, but also set ourselves up for a housing project in the future. Uh, so that is an interesting topic. So what we'll be looking for tonight is your approval for the concept and, and authorizing me to go ahead and work this out. Uh, as we get more immediate, we have the building as it sits now. There are some people that are interested in using it. Uh, we have, haven't solicited a use for that. And I think there's a, a question about whether we we lease it to someone who wants a long term use, which means then that's going to be the long term use. If they're going to invest money to fit up a building, is that you know is that what it's going to be, or are we should we wait for the recreation planning to complete before we decide the future of that building? And if so, if we decide we want to lease it now, then do we work with the two proposals we have, or do we put it out and get a, a broader? a sense of what the community might want. And then lastly, um, so we'd like some direction on all of those tonight. And then lastly, we have a little bit more of an open-ended policy discussion, and that could wait if we run out of time, so we could wait. But the, the whole thing about the concert that came up really pointed out that we have not really put any parameters around the use of, of what we envision for this property while we're planning and what process will be followed to make requests. 
So we thought we might just have some open discussion about what you all think makes sense for uses, and then we would come back at a future meeting with a draft policy. And obviously, we could change the uses at that time and begin kicking off that process because we all found ourselves, I think, caught by surprise and not in a position to respond in an intelligent way other than, gee, we think we've got these concerns. It's not sure this is the right place, et cetera. Fortunately, the Statehouse line saved the day. So uh, anyway. So that's it. Those are the five topics. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. As I said, Josh Jerome is here in person. Mike Miller's on the line. Doug Farnham's here. Uh, and some of many of our other staff are here as well, if you need them. All right. So as I say, this is this is like the big discussion that uh, <clears throat> that we've been wanting to have, need, needing to have to see where things are going and uh, who wants to have a first shot at uh, saying what they want to have on the all right carrie so looking through this list it seems like the the first thing to talk about is the fema trailers and that plan um because we can't we can't build any we can't do anything else on the space where if we go ahead with this FEMA trailer plan, they'll be occupying space that um, could be designated for housing. So I have a question about what's the, the general time frame that, that was being considered about developing housing is two years. Is that gonna be, if the FEMA trailers are there for two years, is that a significant delay to Josh, what we were thinking? So that's a question. I also, um, I'll just kind of get out all my, my thoughts about this. Um, about parking and what the plan is for 36 households. That's like, I'm not sure how, how big those trailers are, how many people live in them, but that could be, you know, 72 cars. Um, I, I don't know if that many cars will fit in the parking lot. So that's a question. And then it, assuming that they do, this ties into the other questions about use of the property. Um, if people are gonna go up there and play soccer on the fields, or if, you know, if we're gonna have some recreation happening there, is there gonna be parking enough for it? Are these compatible? So, so not, yeah. So I think that's kind of the first thing that we have to get clarity about. I can, I can respond to those. So first of all, um, I'll go backwards. Park, parking, it's our understanding, and I don't know if we got, we were gonna ask if we got a confirmation. It's our understanding that each unit will have at least a parking spot for one car. And, and, Minimum, maybe two. At the unit or in that parking lot? In, in, at the unit. There'll be like a little driveway next to the unit. So the, they, they have not at, so basically we asked FEMA to define what parts of the property they were seeking to use and they have not asked for the parking lot. So, uh, and we were trying, we got that question, I think with the question about the cross country scheme, try to confirm that, but it's, it's our belief that, and we, have told them that we need the parking lot. With regard to use of the property, they're well aware of the recreational uses. They know that there'll be soccer and skiing and things going on around. Uh, they're gonna fence their property, their park. They will have security people um, just to protection and manage the operations of the park. They will have um, maintenance folks. So they, they'll be kind of self-contained, but they know that stuff will be going on around them. And they will, they're, I mean, one of the days we met up there, there was soccer going on while we were talking. We're like, this is, and they get it. And in fact, they initially wanted, for understandable reasons, they wanted to put their site in the flat recreation area because it's the easiest to develop. And we basically said, no, that's active recre, you know, that's under use. And then, um, so so I think that those two should be fine. Uh, we've got a meeting, we're setting up a meeting with the cross country people. They may need to alter their course a little to go around where this housing would go. Now, with regard to timing and housing, um that's where we've been spending a lot of time josh please interrupt me at any point when i if i go array awry uh they expect to be there for 18 to 24 months they are they are putting these trailers in where we would consider would be the first housing so the good news is we would have the infrastructure to put the first housing plot. we've asked them and they seem amenable to basically lead to not occupy one of the sections where one of those um, conceived multi-family buildings would go. So that in theory, we could be building that building while the trailers were there. And 
um, it is possible. So can that be done in 18 to 24 months? It might be tight, but it could it could proceed. Um, we're, we're, this is still an idea, and that's part of the reason why I think Mr. Farnham's here. One thought is if we could partner with Downstreet or the state or somebody, we could actually offer them, people could move into the housing and we can move out the trailers and then build out the rest of the housing. So I, it, it will allow it to, and if anything, I mean, there's a lot of variables with housing, as we all know, but having the infrastructure in place will move things along a lot quicker. So you know, as we're talking, there's a lot of people, there's, there's people online who are watching this conversation. Could we put the, put the picture up either the, if someone can. <laughs> there we go. Typical license use agreement, and they'll ask for a six month extension. And the effective start date is July 18th. So that is the start date for um, the 18 month period. I'm sorry. What's the start date? July 18th. July 18th, 2024. 2023. So it's already started. It's already started. Oh, oh, oh. So, Thanks, <laughs> so, so this is, uh, Kelly just put up the proposed FEMA screen, which is, um, which is likely to change, but this was simply showing how they could fit 36 houses in, in that area. If, if we could superimpose, that is basically the first housing pod on our master plan. That is that same location where there are, right now it's shown for multi-family, you know, kind of larger buildings. Um, and so if you, they're gonna come back to us with a revised plan, but for instance, if you look at numbers 17 through 23 there on the left, if those were to move say up to the top, that would free that whole area over there for construction or if they left the top of you know the, the idea is so they're going to come back with a plan that leaves space for one of these buildings to start construction um, assuming they can fit that in and then they would bring the utilities in and in fact they would also stub they're going to try to build the road i mean part of it is one of the one of the good the good part about this is it's a great opportunity the bad part is because we don't have a more specific plan we can't tell them this is exactly where we want the road to go. This is exactly, but I think it's still going to be a plus and they will stub off a utility, uh, you know, the water lines at the other end to be able to go up to the higher ground. Um, so we will be ahead of the game there. Now, for the benefit of people watching at home, if, if we shift the diagram a little bit, <coughs> the, the existing building is like kind of down at the bottom of, of this, right. right? Correct. Right. If you were to, you can see the Elks Club there. That's the existing building, and you can see the the golf court cart path that people right now walk on a lot. So it would be up from there, and then to the right of that are all the flat field areas. And, and there's the little pond in the middle. And could you uh, remind us of if if we if we didn't have uh, FEMA putting the water line in, how much would we or a future developer have to spend to put that in? Well, we don't. So um, we haven't, that's part of the numbers. I don't know if we have that in the preliminary report for this. I, I think we might have it for the whole site. Um, we do know that upsizing the line just from Route 2 up the hill to the site is approximately five hundred to five hundred fifty thousand dollars because we're talking about doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be just getting to just bring the to from the water line from Route 2 up Country Club Road to this area. It's a it's a six inch line it needs to be upgraded to an eight or a twelve, ideally a twelve. Um, they need eight for their size. We would want 12. So we've been negotiating to pay the difference. The city would pay the difference in the pipe size if they're going to lay it anyway. Um, so we'd get the size we want. Um, it's only about a $50,000 difference. So they, they'd be doing the work and we'd pay for them. Jim's question earlier. Is that pipe size then going to serve the rest of Yes, the that's yes. why. That's why we want more. That's why the pump station comes really in. So that's sewer pipe. That's oh. different. Uh, so we probably, they, the sewer, existing sewer there is enough to serve their needs. 
it, it would need to be upgraded for our future needs, but basically we couldn't really make the argument that that it's necessity for them to, to upgrade the line for their uses. The water line, they need hydrants and you have to have an eight inch line, so they have to do that. Um, and then we're just gonna negotiate to have them put in a bigger line that we paid the, the Delta for. Um, but the sewer line, that would still be on us still. We'd have. So I don't know, we don't know what the rest of that is, but they will then have water and sewer service throughout this whole area, as well as three phase power brought in um, by Green Mountain Power, which we would have to do. So it's a huge start. It's really the big initial infrastructure investment that we would have to make uh, to go up. Are we talking about the power line being uh, buried or on poles? Uh, they talked about buried. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Um, I just had another question. The question that people, one question that people are asking me a lot is, who are the people who are going to be living here? Uh, I don't know if Doug wants to answer this. He might be able to. Ah, Doug is the recovery thanks. chief recovery officer in the state of Vermont. Doug Farnham. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, so, this. yes, the, the displaced individuals, essentially over 200 um, people statewide had significant enough damage where they cannot occupy their homes right now. Over half of those are in Washington County. And then of that group, um, at least 50 have signed up for this direct housing program from FEMA, meaning right now they cannot find any other place to live in Vermont because of the shortages in our housing market. Um, so despite their best efforts, they can't find a place to live. And that's our major concern and why I'm uh, really thankful that Montpelier is considering working with FEMA on this um, because that size of um, th those 36 lots in would really satisfy the need in central Vermont. And we'd have to, you know, figure out solutions in other counties. Um, but we are very concerned that people won't have a place to uh, live before the winter comes. And obviously, even at a best clip, this would be going in maybe just in time for winter. Um, but I do think that that's very important. A lot of the uh, households came from Berlin. There was a large number of of households that were uh, properties that were condemned in Berlin. Uh, that's where most of them, I believe, coming from. Thanks, Tim. Just curious, is there, knowing what we go through for permitting for everything else we do, is there any special dispensation to allow this to happen quickly so you don't have to go through this permit gauntlet that yes. normally we would face? So because we are still in a state of emergency, mm -hmm. um, the governor can exercise his emergency powers to adjust or waive permit uh, permitting requirements. So uh, we do view this, these, this population of displaced households as, you know, it's a direct result of the flood. It's directly related to immediate life safety. So I do think, you know, we would go through and work with the city and work with FEMA, and we would try to remove as many barriers as we could reasonably remove um, but the powers do extend to permitting and they do extend to temporary exemptions from statute. Again, we don't want to um, abuse the powers, but we do think that this is a situation that um, if Montpelier is on board with this, it merits a lot of urgency and we would do our best to make sure it happens as well. Good. Thank you. And to that point, FEMA, the FEMA officials who are very um, it, adamant that they do follow all local regulations for why they asked us what we need for you know they they appreciate an expedited permitting process but they said we will you know uh when we met with them on site a secretary of war from a &R was present and they said yep we're following we know your stormwater rules we're going to follow them you know so they they were pretty clear about all those kind of things i know there's a lot of concern about the timing and with good reason we're in mid-september now I, the only answer we got from them was this is what we do you know we did this in North Dakota. We did this in Oregon. We did this in Louisiana. You know, this we we put these things in and we do them fast and we bring the resources to get it done. And uh, you know, we'll see. But that's so how about us, Vermont Pillier? I mean, are we going to be willing to step aside and make this happen? Because I think we really haven't oh. for downtown stuff. We're making people get permits now. Well, you know, they would have to get permits, but I don't know. That okay, they... that's what I'm asking. Yeah. But I don't think it would. We haven't really. 
we said that we would do what we could to get that as well. But, but having yeah. lived through what you could, Bill, I'm really wary. Yeah. I really what, wary. What's our take on that? Well, local permits? For permits for these folks to do this project. For the FEMA project? Yeah. Uh, in terms of like local permitting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I'd assume that they we, we would help them go through our local permitting process. But and that's what I'm saying. Can it be a... expedited? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, DRB meets pretty often. Um, and I mean, I don't know what the process is to, to have a DRB meeting just like ad hoc or if we're just going to wave it. So our, our commitment to that was that we'd expedite as quickly as we could because of the emergency nature. I get what you're saying, but I'm living through some no. expedited bill and I'm not happy. Yeah. And exactly. I'm trying to tell you. No, that. I hear that. No, I, I and it's Bobby a good clear. Point. So, I mean, Northfield Bank took three extra weeks because of monthly or permitting to get a temporary branch. I know what I'm going through with permitting for our properties, trying to get things going, and I don't feel helped a lot. Okay. So if we're going to help this project to happen, it's got to be more than, oh, we're going to work through our little process here. Fair got it? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Sal and then Lauren. Uh, I'm just wondering if um, how hard and fast the 18 to 24 months is given the, you know, given the climate available housing i imagine some of these displaced folks are are rebuilding and that that market's also very crowded um what what is the uh what's the experience what is FEMA's experience with with these sorts of things being extended and and how long are they typically extended for if at all so um i, I may need some help from mr farnham here but uh what we understand is that the fema program and when we talk about the FEMA program, it's putting the house in, but then they manage the site. So they basically serve as the, the mobile home park manager, for lack of a better word. They do maintenance, they do tenant behavior, anything that needs to be handled, uh, they take care of. Uh, and they run their program for 18 months. They We were told they often extend it for another six months, given that it started on July 18. And by the time they get this done, it'll probably be almost six months into the, the program. After that, uh, then the state and local officials can work on how to, uh, what to do. So people have, I think, the authority, the ability to buy their trailer and move it to another site. Again, if this is very theoretical, if we were building a building along with a partner, where these folks had first right, you know, it's conceivable we could work with the state to extend on here the management of the site until the new building was built and people could move in and then remove the trailers. But we will need to, there will be a need to be an exit plan at the end. We they, because they can't just be left there without somebody managing the site. So that absolutely the so from FEMA's perspective, once the 18 months are up, and if they renew once the 24 months are up they are done at that point. They they don't go past their timelines, right? Uh, from the state's perspective, we want these households to have stable housing for as long as possible. And we understand that the city has plans for, for that location. And hopefully we could work together on some type of transition plan. I think there's going to be multiple uh, large housing projects in, in Montpelier and in Barrie and other areas around the state. And I think uh, managing those transitions I think is going to be very important. Um, so I do think we will need a program to most likely help people if they want to move off that site to another location, if they want to buy their trailer and they want to set it up somewhere else. Um, we're going to need to work on making sure those those sites are available two years from now because we don't have open sites right now. That's part of the problem. Um, so we will be working over the next two years to make sure there's capacity for them to move. And I do think the concept of allowing them first right of refusal, essentially on a, on a unit in the affordable housing section um, has some merit and should be um, definitely explored uh, with that population. I'm not sure how many of them would take them up on that, but from FEMA's experience, um, from my conversations with Will Roy, the, not everyone stays for the entire length of time, right? They, Generally, they they look for other options while they're in there, and then they um, they they move out as they find other options. And it wouldn't be like a population would be cycling into that. You know, this is a discrete group of individuals that are eligible for this program, 
And we wouldn't be moving other people into those locations if, if any of them free up in, during that 18 to 24 month period. So I wanna acknowledge that uh, should the transition would be very important. Uh, we don't want it to be a hard stop from the state's perspective. And we acknowledge that there needs to be a, an exit strategy for the city of Montpelier. And, and just as a follow-up, um, how does FEMA leave the site uh, at the end of the two-year period? I mean, you, you've got utilities and so on. Are they, they're all stubbed up and capped off and marked or what, what they, happens? They said that they would leave it however we wanted it, uh, including in some places they restore it. It's close back to its original, you know, some places they actually remove the utilities that they put in um, to you know, if, if there was a field and people wanted to keep it a field, they'll try to restore it to a field. Uh, they had a long, that's one of the reasons why they wanted to know what we wanted to do with the site afterward. And so we said, yes, we want you know, the infrastructure to stay in, but they would leave it in the way that we requested. It's one of the reasons we're trying to coordinate with them now with DPW and planning about how to lay everything out is best, you know, in a way that works for all the best. So there'll be a, uh, we'll have an opportunity at the end to to uh, alter or modify what we what we discuss now, since it's very difficult to predict what what it's going to look like in two years. Well, or, the, or not. Just curious. well, the, you know the where the water lines and sewer lines and the and roads go aren't going to you know mod. I mean, once they're in, they're in, and the the trailers will be gone at some point, and there will be you know new housing going in there. Um, I think the our modification would be, you know, we want you to pull everything out and restore it back to open field, which I don't think we want to do. Um, and so it would be at that point, we'll we'll accept this infrastructure from you. And then if we have to make changes to it at that point, I mean, I suppose if we wanted them to, I, I don't know, we haven't got that far yet, but maybe if we wanted them to move a, a line or a road or something, they might do that. But um, we could we could discuss the idea is to try to get it as close to right as we can and at the front end so we don't have to do many changes at the end yeah no i i appreciate that i'm just uh wondering if there's an some sort of allowance in the agreement that some discussion would take place at the end given that uh things may have changed on our part as well as uh on, on fema's part we could certainly raise that uh, you know we don't have a written agreement yet we're just you know we're laying out the terms what would be discussed so that part of part of tonight is to see whether you want us to go ahead with that so uh we would obviously have a have to have a final uh, covering that. so that's a good point we can add that in uh, lauren yeah thanks um i mean first of all big picture really grateful this is in the works i think just the urgency of getting shelter for people. So thank you to everyone who's working on this and trying to make it happen. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, did just want to underscore the importance of the transition plan, both knowing, I'm sure we've all read stories of the quality of these trailers and just knowing getting people into long-term housing so they're not in this temporary situation. So just how important that will be and hopefully we can partner for the Montpelier side and hopefully it's a bigger state regional effort. Um, and my question was kind of answered um, when I first raised my hand, but just trying to understand. So if we're invoking, you know, emergency authority, but the city still has some say, just knowing that this site, you know, we have these long-term vision for it. So just, I mean, do we have, because of the permitting, you know, there's this tension between we want this in as quickly as possible, and we want to make sure it's done in a way that is going to facilitate the long-term housing that we need. And so just like, could they decide to do something that we don't like on the site? I mean, like, is it this, it ultimately is, a, is an agreement yeah. that's gonna be written with the city and FEMA and the state, or how does that work if it's state emergency authority? Like, could the state supersede us? So there's two there's two issues here. One is that there's permitting, and you know, we've raised a good issue when I've already sent a message to the planning director about how we work our way through that. Um, but the second issue is where the land on. And so anything they need, uh, they need permission from us. So, you know, um, so we would say this is this is what we will give you permission to build. And then we've got to figure out how to build. I mean, within reason, I understand, but I mean, they can't suddenly come in and do something different on our property. They would uh, we have an agreement that says here's what you do and that's what you do. Okay. Uh, so we have we have even more control even than permitting with that because we are we're the landowner. So we can say you're gonna have this kind of hydrant, you're gonna have this sort of thing. And here's our here's our codes and here's our 
think so. Mr. Farnham? I would just add that uh, the state would not be a party to the agreement in any way. Like Bill said, the the town, the city is the landowner. Um, the only involvement the state state would have is, you know, if certain permitting or processes needed to be waived to move it faster. That's the involvement we would have, and then separately working together to figure out what the transition would be like because FEMA would not be involved in that transition plan at all. They kind of have a just a hard stop to their to their processes. So the the transition would be between the state and the city, um, and yes, emergency powers al would allow the governor to do some things involving real property. That is definitely not what we are talking about here. It is the city's property, and the state's going to respect that. Just hearing this, um, a question that occurred to me that maybe nobody knows the answer to yet is: Would this be? permitted as a mobile home park under title 10 and then would it be subject to state you know the statutory and uh, regulatory provisions for uh, discontinuing a mobile home park when it uh, <clears throat> when we get to the end of that process can't give you the answer to that right now other than to say that this has always been Everything we've talked about, including with the state, has been that this is, you know, a temporary mm -hmm. arrangement. This is not a mobile home park that's intended to be there for long. This is an emergency provision. Even when we were talking to Secretary Moore about the provisions, which she understood, this is this is not this is not somebody coming in for a subdivision to create a long term. This is an emergency need that has the benefit of um, creating an infrastructure. You know, our our follow up projects would presumably need to go through all the processes and you know, permits, the more permanent locations on there. So that could be one of these things where you talked about waiving statutory requirements. That could be one of those requirements, how we, how, how a mobile home park would ordinarily get permitted versus how, how we're doing this. Yes, I also think it's something I can research on the state's end and make sure there won't be any surprises or roadblocks there. But uh, the, the other factor here is that this is a federal government program. It's not a private commercial park. So I, I think that would be something that, you know, would, would more than justify an exception. Uh, I know that we are going to be having discussions with the legislators about in the upcoming session, and we could make sure that um, there's, there's nothing, um, no unintended consequences. Great, thank you. Um, Sal. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a, a long list. I, ju I just haven't seen it. So that's why I'm asking these questions. Um, I'm assuming that, uh, well, I'm wondering if uh, what, what services FEMA provides with um, respect to the property, um, you know, plowing, um, trash pickup, uh, grading the road in the spring, you know, that kind of stuff. Is that all handled by FEMA as the, as the manager of the, of the project? Yes, and um, and actually, I believe it's going to be paved road, um, not not gravel. So, yeah, yeah, we'll be plowing there. The, the anything on vegetation, right. picking up the trash. Yep. Uh, so I think this is a wonderful opportunity, and and thank the resources of FEMA to allow us to work with this and meet this need. If we were to go ahead with this, I'm thinking of a motion to authorize you to act on our behalf. How wide of a spectrum of authority do you need? Because you're going to be negotiating and putting this. You would be, you know, I, I think, you know, obviously I could bring it back for final approval if if you wanted. I, it's really just timing, right? It's you know, time. we'd have we might we might need to call a special meeting or something like that. It's more to be able to keep this moving uh, without having to come back to the council but it, that's fine too but we just need to you know i think the the terms so to speak that we've talked about I mean, we pretty much discussed it's what what the timing is what how the lay you know our concerns for layout the future infrastructure and i think i'd say the issue that's most undecided is the the water line from route two up you know that's the, the probably the biggest area and um you know maybe 
you can put that in your motion, right? <laughs> essential. That's yeah. well. That's I, the, you know, it, it really is. I mean, as I said, they said they would follow all of our regulations. Yep. It, our regulations would call for at least two hydrants here. And if it, NFPA regulations require an eight-inch line to serve hydrants, so it's a six-inch line, so they can't it really is regulatory. And then our ask would be if you're putting in the line anyway, put in a bigger one, and we'll pay, you know, we'll pay the, the delta. So I mean, that seems really the right thing to do. I mean, I, I certainly would like you to be able to act forward and, and move on this as quickly as possible. I mean. December, it's going to be snowing before December. It's going to be a tight line. Um, so I'd, I'd entertain a, a motion. I mean, I'd give a motion uh, to authorize a bill to act on our behalf to work in a contract with FEMA to achieve these 36 units for 24 months. Okay, is there a second? Okay, it's moved and seconded. Any <clears throat> other discussion? Lauren. On the process point, I mean, to me, I think just keep it moving. And if it's all consistent with everything we've talked about, I mean, obviously, I, I would think if some change to that or some big red flag, then we could call a special meeting and try to make it an emergency and keep everything moving. But, Absolutely. you know, if it's consistent with the, I mean, conversation we've just had, I would want to, I just no, want to be clear that I, I'm voting to like, keep it moving. <laughs> Exactly. That Bill knows he'd have to come back and face us, and he's going to do it from here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tim, did you have your hand up too? Just thinking that do we include in the motion something about expedited permitting and on the city that's part, and then we really want to make every effort to make this forward quickly. That, that I sounds, shouldn't have to say it, but I that sounds like consistent. I do. <laughs> sounds consistent with the intent, doesn't it? Yeah. The intent was to expedite the project, right? Yes. So whatever it takes to yes. expedite the project. Right. Lauren. And does the motion reflect that we want to ensure that the infrastructure being built reflects the long-term needs? So the yeah. longer, the bigger pipe, water pipe. I mean, I want to make sure that's part of it. I said everything we already talked about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> John's sure answering that. Include. He's got it. John, are you okay with that? Or do you need a more? I think, I think we're at breaking point. I think I got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sal, I'll call on you. And then I see some members of the public who also want to be heard. Um, I'm just wondering if we can um, postpone uh, a vote on this motion until we've talked about the, the Good Samaritan. Uh, just, I mean, I, I like what I've heard so far about this, the FEMA project, but I'd, I'd like to hear from the, a uh, little bit more about the Good Sam project, which is taking place right, right on the property as well, and maybe uh, put those motions together, or at least... Um, have all the information before we vote on each of them separately. So um, at this point, we're not really voting on the Good Sam proposal tonight. I think we had shared that and everyone, you know, we were going ahead with that based on the emergency need for shelter. Um, but we have had conversations with them and with FEMA. FEMA knows this is happening there. Uh, Good Sam knows that th this is being considered. As I mentioned, FEMA plans to have security uh, on their site um, for to protect their tenants and also to keep you know help manage their tenants I guess and um, Good Sam will be an evening shelter seven or eight p.m. till seven or eight p.m. in the morning they will have people on site to manage their site um, you know we're we're confident that there is resources and places to manage situations. Uh, and obviously we can have emergency response as necessary. I mean, things can happen, but really they are going to be separated. There will be, like I said, a fence around the FEMA site. They will, people will be in the Good Sam facility. Uh, the plan, I think, for Good Sam is to transport people back and forth because the, the meals and things are downtown, so they don't really have those facilities up there. So, um, you know, we've we've talked about this a lot with all all involved. Um, Thank you for that, Bill. Joe Castellano and then Linda Berger. Uh, thanks for calling to me. Um, I missed the uh, first part of the meeting, so I'm unsure if this is going to be redundant. But I assume that there's been a um, analysis as far as I assume we're leasing to FEMA for two years that land and that site. Is there a lease analysis or what sort of rent? Are we charging FEMA? Is there, is there any sort of figures on that? 
Um, there is no lease. It's a federal program, emergency program. Uh, and when they're working with a local government uh, and that, um, so the in-kind infrastructure that we're getting, um, it's one of the reasons they've been willing to discuss uh, some additional infrastructure work that meets our future needs in lieu of a financial lease. And then I had one other follow-up, Bill. Um, I know that you talked about there being a bigger water line because there is proposed development for the country club, uh, you know, for down the road. And you said the town will pay for the additional funds. And I know that in one of the recent articles in the bridge, you said that we've been impacted pretty severely financially due to the flooding. And of course, a lot of downtown businesses are also suffering. I'm just wondering where this is gonna come from out of our budget. Well, that's a great question. Um, and I'm happy to answer it. Uh, so the difference between an eight inch line and a 12 inch line is about $50,000. Uh, okay. is in the total project, it would be five hundred or five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So it's a pretty wise investment on our part in terms of future development tax revenue and those kinds of things. We would because it's water, we would take it from the water fund uh, and there are reserves there. The water fund has not been hit as much as the general fund. Um, obviously, um, we'd prefer not to spend any money, but sometimes, uh, you know, even in hard times, you have to make good decisions for looking forward. And so that's, that's the order of magnitude we're talking about. And one final question. I know that there's a proposed site plan, which doesn't necessarily follow what the concept A, which I believe everybody was in favor of. Um, so with the roads that are going to be in there, are those going to be able to be reused once FEMA's out of there? So you did miss that part of the conversation, um, but the the FEMA housing is is supposed is intended to go into the, that first pod that is in concept A. Okay. We have we are working so that the infrastructure would be coming into there. So we would have water, sewer power, and a road into that. Uh, they they've seen our plan. The plan they put out was really just to see a massing plan to see how they could get on there. Um, they're going to come back with us with a different layout to try to get it as close to ours as possible, understanding that this isn't necessarily a final plan either. Uh, it is a concept plan. Uh, so yes, we will be able to reuse all of that infrastructure uh, to develop going forward. And you know, if we have to reroute a road, maybe we do, but we hope we won't have to. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Now, Linda. Yes, thank you. I just had a question about uh, transportation for the the people that are housed by FEMA. Um, it's a pretty isolated setting. And um, I'm just wondering about that. And is there an answer about that? Um, I'm kind of looking at Doug Farnham. Um, I think the presumption here is these are people that have been living in homes, living in apartments, and that they will have their own transportation. Uh, I don't know what happens if there will be an assessment on an individual basis. Generally speaking, these were individual homeowners, so they likely had transportation. We haven't really assessed that, but what I can do is follow up with the agency of transportation and see if there are any options for adjusting certain shuttle routes or anything like that so that uh, you know we could um, serve this new population in a different place. I, I think one of our concerns initially was the railroad tracks and access up with that many people. So um, that's still kind of an open problem if everybody's got their car. Yeah, I mean, I think the if it's 36 vehicles, people don't always leave at the same time in the course of a day. Uh, the, the railroad does not run that often. Um, uh, we're not seeing that in the next year or two as being a, a significant issue uh, as far as egress and ingress. There's already heavy use for fields, recreation activity. You know, any given afternoon, there's a, probably 30 cars up there uh, now and probably are leaving at approximately the same time once activities end. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a require, there will be more analysis of that required as, we think about building out a bigger project there, but for this use, we're not anticipating a big problem. Thanks, Linda. Thank um, Rick, Rick DeAngelis. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, Rick DeAngelis, uh, co-director of Good Samaritan. 
Uh, just a few comments about the shelter uh, at the country club. Uh, first of all, you know, we're, we're really pleased to be leasing that space. It, um, I think it's going to meet our needs very well. It's very decent space, uh, clean, well-lighted, attractive. Uh, there's a small kitchenette in the area that we'll be leasing. Um, and I want to thank the city staff in the middle of everything that was going on with the flood, they helped to facilitate and to make this happen. And we really appreciate that a lot. Um, with respect to the uh, the FEMA trailer and the FEMA neighborhood, wow, what a, I'm just, uh, it's so good to hear about this. What a great thing. And um, it's gonna help us in two ways. One, in a very, in a more of a global way, these are people that don't have housing and they're go not gonna need our shelter. Uh, so that's a good thing. And then secondly, um, everything I've heard about this plan uh, gives me comfort that it's going to be well managed. And uh, I was really uh, pleased to hear that there's going to be security on site. So um, I'm just looking forward to, to being up there. And I think it's um, we can exist, uh, uh, peacefully coexist with, with the FEMA development. Thanks, Rick. I don't want to foreclose discussion prematurely, but are we ready to vote? If so, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. I, I think this is great. I don't see how we can not do this. I think this is really... Uh, Great. And a number of people have asked me, well, you know, we know what's happened in Montpelier. People know that there's been a lot of uh, housing loss in Barry. And then my friends are saying, to me, well, well, what's happening to those people who lost their houses? And, and this is really reassuring that this is going to meet the need for central Vermont. Thank All you, right. Doug, for coming. Thanks for being here. Yes. You're welcome to hang out the rest of the night, but that's the FEMA part stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So one down. Any direct question about FEMA? I've heard that they have been meetings about some regional long term follow up in FEMA. Uh, and I just wondered if we have city staff participating in it. Um, uh, it's a, it's a long-term follow-up. Uh, FEMA has laid out sort of a, a whole structure where when you have an incident of disaster like this, that they, they follow up and encourage local uh, development of groups that then follow up long-term. And... So so that model, like, so we aren't haven't engaged with FEMA specifically on that, but that model is essentially what we just did with the community, that with the yeah. community forums and setting up people involved and setting up local groups to follow up on issues, that kind of thing. When I talked with Waterbury, and that's essentially what they did. They went through a whole process, except it took them a year and a half to lay out those priorities that we've already done and then set up a leading group because it was being led by FEMA. So we we've sort of went it alone here. Well, it's more of a regional focus instead of like ours was really, our our meetings were wonderful, but they were Montpelier driven. Barry's been having them independently. And this was supposedly a little higher view more regionally. So um, we have not been contacted okay. with FEMA about this and about organizing this in our area. Uh, I know that it happened in Waterbury, like I said, in 2011. Um, but there have been some meetings happening. So I'll... Put you in touch. You yeah, told me about right. it. Okay. You know something I don't know, which isn't surprising. <laughs> Didn't have enough. Doesn't take much. Uh, Sal. Uh, I was just thinking that um, I think we we might want to revisit the uh, hunting situation on the property. Didn't we um, essentially extend the used to include hunting since it had been traditionally allowed on that property. And now it's, I mean, I can't imagine the hunting is going to be any good with all that heavy equipment out there, but um, should we officially do something about um, the status of hunting on that property now that it's going to be uh, 
residential. So fortunately, on tonight's list of five things to talk about is the use of the property, a policy on use of the property. So presumably hunting would be one of those items that we would talk about. Yeah, Bill and I were talking about that the other day. It's uh, once this is, once there are people living there, it's hard, hard to see hunting being a, a practical or safe use. So where should we go from here? We have, Bill, were you wanting to talk about recreation next? Uh, well, I, I thought we would start with, you know, the I kind of picture. arranged them from big to yeah. big to narrow, but we kind of jumped in the middle. Um, so really whatever the council would like to talk about next. Well, I think it makes sense to talk about the big picture, yeah. the overall plan, because that's really, what all the work has been getting us to. Right. Um, and the overall plan we have is the units, the general outline of where they're gonna be. Oh, and thank you, Kelly. Are you about to put the uh, the bigger picture on the uh, concept A? Concept A on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's useful while we're talking. Anyone want to start? Eric. Um, all right, so we're talking about the overall plan. Yes. And we're being asked to come up with a number of units. And we're also being asked um, to finalize the areas designated for each kind of use. So I might need a little refresher. We got in, in our actionable master plan, we've got this concept A. Is that what's on the um, really? concept A? And so I think staff is asking us to say, this is good, do this. Right. And we've discussed this in the past, but we never quite got to that point, right? Of right. saying yes, do this. Okay. So um as we're looking at the 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 whole plan, there's a lot more to the plan than just what's on this map. And so I think we need to have a, a discussion about kind of the whole the whole plan and the, the next step to come. And I mean, I think this is a good concept. Um, I'm you know, I think it's I think it's worth pursuing. Um, but I think that it's a bigger question because there's tons of recommendations. There's pages and pages of next steps. And so I would love us to be able to kind of get clear on what we're directing staff to do and say, yes, we think these are the good next steps to take and you should take them and get going on them. Um, I don't feel like, I don't feel like it makes a lot of sense for us to decide on a specific number of units at this point. And if you read through this plan, like every other sentence is now don't take any of this written in stone. It's all going to change, which makes sense. Um, and we don't know who's going to develop this. If anyone's going to develop it, we don't know what they're going to come up with when they start to develop. There's a lot of next steps that involve permit assessment, more due diligence, looking at the site. Is there going to be blasting required? Um, there's a lot of variables that could influence how many things get built. So if we don't have to say a certain number, but if we can just say, we like this concept of multifamily housing in these general areas, I'd be a lot more comfortable with that. So I can, I can respond to that if, if you like, unless somebody else was ready to jump in. Um, I agree that we can't set a set number. And I think what we were, what we were really talking about was um, if we had a target. So, if you set 300 as the target, you, you won't get 400, right? And so if we if we say we'd like to shoot for, you know, the higher end of what's possible and that we have to do all these steps, I mean, these these are all things. We've got to do the zoning, we've got to do the master plan, we've got, you know, all the, the engine, all that stuff. And at some point, you know, we would come back to you and say, you know what, 372 is the sweet spot. We can't get 500. And, that, and here's why. And because of blasting or, or whatever. What what we're trying to get it is is that 
you as the council, you know, if you think about the the big policies, is this the direction you want to go? And and are you, would you like us to tr- pursue? And we're going to ultimately we're going to come back at some point about the rec area and say, you know, is this where you want us to go? And it'll probably include everything under the sun. Doesn't mean we'll end up with you know pools and basketball, but you, you won't get them if you don't start looking and assessing them. And we know there's all this stuff. So basically, we're saying we're ready to start taking this stuff on, you know, in the order that it needs to be taken on. But we we haven't expended resources, well, part because of the flood, but also part we want to make sure that you were saying to us, now start putting this into action. This we're okay with the idea. We would like you to get as many units as you can possibly get on there, or we want a mix of units, or we're in the, you know. This is the range we'd like to see. I know there was some question about could we put housing, you know, further down here, uh, and we actually came up with an idea. Well, if if we were to build a new uh, community building, maybe housing could be upper floors. So we get both both worlds. You could have, you know, you could have use the space double uh, to to get those and have and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, those are all ideas that can still be considered. We're just, I think, we're excited. I think, you know. We get hearing a lot when, you know, nothing's going to happen until we get going. And so we're basically saying we want the council to say, okay, we've coalesced. This is the general idea. This is the general number we're looking for. Start and keep bringing us back the information, the decision points as you get information and when you get design costs and when you get these things. So that's what the staff's looking for. That's the kind of direction we're seeking to Not specifically it's going to be 472 units and they're going to be exactly right here. And, and Bill, it looked like uh, Tim was... Yeah, about to say something. Too. I want to ask, throw in a question too, which is that the conceptual plan we've been talking about has mostly been, you know, multi-unit housing of various kinds, you know, townhouses, uh, apartments, that kind of thing. Um, does this? I've also heard people say, well, there's a role for uh, for single-family housing as part of this, and is that something that? Uh, we need to decide now in order to uh, for the for you and your staff to be moving forward. Well, a lot of people, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to respond to that, but I don't want to jump on Tim. No, go ahead. So, one of the things that struck me about reading this was it wasn't really clear to me that the um, the plans for what kind of housing were based on anything other than people's opinions, like the public opinion primarily, and those of us on city council. And that doesn't feel like a strong enough basis to make that decision to me. I don't know. Like, I, I want to know more things about what's the actual need in the community, like the market, what developers are out there who need to get funding for those kinds of projects. So I would, I would rather not limit us at this point. I would say that, you know, we have a preference for getting a number of people in there for a diversity of housing. We are, we don't have a preference for, you know, 10 story tall buildings, but I, I don't know, you know, if someone came up with a, if some developer wanted to do that and could make a good case for it, I'd be open to it. So I, I want so to keep it flexible. With me saying how, how flexible can we be at this stage and still enable the city to plan well to move forward? <laughs> Tim, a lot <laughs> um, about this project. I, it's a beautiful piece of land that we bought. I think it certainly seems to have jumped in ahead of other priorities we may have had as a community prior to this purchase. Um, you know, the recreational opportunities, about 80% of it on this plan that we're looking at is recreation at some level, which is wonderful. And I think in a big picture, I, maybe we can endorse that tonight. Um, I think that's clearly part of what's going to happen. Uh, we have, you know, maybe we've done some more engineering since we last talked because it's if you got water line sizes, must be something to happen. Um, but we, so we, I don't want to interrupt your speech, but just so yeah. you know, I mean, basically, we used our own engineering staff to say what size line did we need okay. to serve that many people plus size. And, and we also, and we know that an eight inch is required. Yeah. for the hydrant. So it was, it was our, you know, we haven't designed the whole thing, but we know, I mean, it's eight or 12, and, and yeah. the 12 should, you know, basically on your own calculations. Okay. 
So I, mean, I, th I still think we need to do some basic engineering, yeah, we do, and absolutely. which I've been talking about for months, but to really quantify what we can do in this site, um, it appears in this material that we got for this meeting, it's a little different than I remember from our last public meetings, but it sounds like the secondary road is going to be required out um, for this number of homes. It, it didn't sound like it was as optional in this report as I heard just people talking at the last presentation that Clayton Burke did. So if that's definite, that's a really big cost and infrastructure piece we're going to face. And it has to be considered as we look at the viability of this whole project. And looking at numbers, talking with other developers who actually have built streets recently or gotten really recent estimates, um, you know, just if it's roughly 0.85 of a mile from the middle of this site down to somewhere on Barry Street to connect through the Ages of Jersey property, if you went that route, at today's cost, just for the road without the engineering design, probably having to build bridges or culverts, you know, you're over 6.7 just for that. Um, if you go up to the Brock property the other way, it's a little less. You'd be in the three to four million dollar range, which is still more than we paid for the whole property. Um, I, I think we've really got to look at the big picture. And I think the real big picture is we're not developers and we really should keep out of that business. I think we should set this project up so housing can be created on the portion that we think should be housing. We've got to modify our zoning because our, our zoning right now won't allow this to happen. Um, so I think that's something we really need to do. And then step out, you know, set it up. You know, you'll have control because of we own it. You can define who you sell it to. You're going to have be able to define through permitting processes what they can build. So you can say no 10-story buildings, you know, whatever. But let the market decide what kind of housing. At whatever point in time this actually happens, because I don't think it's going to happen for at least a couple of years in case things are going. So I guess that would be my take is let's define the rec part, let that get going. Um, let's do some basics to set the table for someone to create some great housing up here. And then let's get out of the way and let them do it. <laughs> so just to quickly, not, I think those are all great points. Just to answer your initial question, we have not done any additional work because when we last discussed it, the plan was we were going to have this workshop conversation. And so we, and then of course it got delayed because of other factors. So here we are. So all of those are appropriate things that we need to follow up, including the, the need and costs and, you know, are these eligible for state housing funds right now? There's a lot of state housing money that, uh, that you know, so we, we get it, all of that stuff. How much would a TIF generate? The, the analysis was done on a local only TIF. If this could become a state, you know, education tax TIF, that would drive a lot more revenue that could do a lot more of those kind of things. So all of those are absolutely, that's the kind of work that needs to be done next. And we're basically saying we, we, we want to start that analysis work and then figure out where you go. But we wanted whatever guideposts you wanted to give us before we started, you know, so we don't want to assume that we know what you want. Yep. So, Donna. It may sound that we're not on the same page, Tim, but I, I think we are. Is I do think we set the guidepost, and whether that's guidepost of 300, 400 houses, that we have some concept of how many units we want on that piece of land. And for me, it's really important that it doesn't have single homes. I don't want to see another town hill. I, I want to see dense housing with shared gardens and shared parks mm -hmm. that young people and seniors can afford. We know how much I mean, you can go to the data, just seniors alone, that we need housing and young families and single. We have many more single people. So I, I think it's great that we turn it over and get staff looking at specific information. But I do feel we need them guideposts, that we need to give that vision out. So that's where I'm at is some guidepost. Mm -hmm. It's important. And so the guideposts you're thinking about are things like rough order of magnitude for the number of units, um, general concept that you uh, prefer multi, not to have like single family housing. Groups of townhouses, uh, uh -huh. shared units, you know, since so housing. Generally numbers. putting it where, where that uh, map yeah. shows that yeah. you put it. Yeah. We're going to rezone this, and it's going to go through a zoning process mm -hmm. and that ultimately come back to city council at yep. some point in the So we will have that approval with the rezoning when it's studied mm -hmm. through zoning to say, how can we do this? So, I'm not worried about zoning. You are. I, I'm, yeah, <laughs> because I've been doing more than you have. It's, uh, it's, it's, 
it's an interesting process, but it's also a very public process. And, yeah. and so I think is, and because we're really spot zoning this, because right now it doesn't even fit our, our zoning code. We're making it be something we want it to be for our own use. Um, it would seem like the right thing to do is let it be rezoned, work through staff, get the recommendations on dense housing. They're I think, clear on what the community said in this process, which was that. And then we approve it if we like it. That's the amount of that. Donna. Thank you. Well, I think if we have the vision, then we can get the zoning done and not make it spot zoning, but do it with a vision of a different kind of housing setting than we've had in the past. Sure. So you're right. The zoning needs to be done. And hopefully once we have our vision, and I, I still follow in line with all the public meetings. I feel we have that information and that's still sort of my vision. And as we get information, we will change it. Yeah. Just to that point, and I don't want to at all presume to speak for the planning director, um, but it's, I think what we're really looking at, to, to Tim's point of spot zoning is, you know, we have, we have this parcel that Sabin's next door that wants to do some kind of housing, and then the, the, the land that used to be owned to the college, and, you know, should we be looking at that neighborhood, you know, as a zoning, as a, as a new growth area, and, you know, our growth current growth center ends at Sabin. So this would be extending it into this one property, uh, which would then allow to do some things. And then, you know, thinking about if that road were to go through, how that could serve housing in all those projects and what kind of investment would have to be made. But, you know, maybe, maybe the city doing that would spur work in other places. So yes, it's all absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, at least the, the the as I understand it, the thinking is to try to make it as permissive as possible on the site, um, you know, given natural resources, et cetera. Um, Ellen. Yeah, uh, thank you. So when we uh, were discussing to have this workshop, I mentioned um, some people ask me about public transportation, because if um, like old people, elderly, or uh, single uh, people if they want to leave there and they will not have cars. So how will they will like come to downtown or go other places? So is there any plan uh, to create public transportation for this uh, side of the town? So it will connect it to rest of the uh, downtown. It would seem to me that that's going to be, a, you know, an essential part of the planning process is, you know, and, and that, you know, right now, public transportation in Vermont is pretty, you know, it's it's funded largely by the state and it's based on where people are and what their needs are, their route needs are. So if suddenly there's, a, you know, going to be a much larger population here, it, you know, I think we'd be in a better position to try to negotiate a route. Uh, up in here, particularly if there's a, a youth center or a community center that people want to go to. Uh, so absolutely, that would, I think it would have to be part of the, the planning for this is how how do people get back and forth so it doesn't just become an automobile hub. So can we also think about other ways in addition to public transportation, maybe like shuttles, um, you know, just give uh, different alternatives so right. people won't be dependent on only one, uh, you know, modality uh, of like, yeah, driving around. So, correct. No, I think I mean all of that is some form of public transportation, whether it's a big bus or a small shuttle, or you know maybe uh, you know I just thought of this now, so there's no thought to the merit of it. But you know, depending, maybe a developer creates a neighborhood association and they have their own neighborhood van that. You know, that okay, comes from you know, some senior housing things do that, but okay. you know, it just becomes part of hey, you live here, you get this transportation route or something. So, I think there's a lot of things we could think about. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, whatever type we are talking, it will be part of the public transportation planning anyway. Correct. Okay, yeah, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I'm a little bit unclear how much specificity the city needs. Like, I mean, just looking through the plan, it's 
you know, okay, we need to step one, do zoning. We need growth center designation. Look at the TIF, do a housing needs assessment. Like it's all here. Yes. And so I so, just need to sell them, tell us to go on that. <laughs> right. But I guess what I'm not clear. So, I mean, I think it's all here and then yeah. it's got their RFP. Like everything we're talking about is in the plan. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we've talked about it before. We had a lot of new counselors. So we wanted to be able to make sure that the concept that had been kind of like we were ready to go and then we had a bunch of new counselors and we wanted to make sure. So I'll, I guess it's just, is this really off base, this concept for the folks who have come in and that's all you need to know, or is there more specificity than that? That's okay. <laughs> I'm so good with where we live. <laughs> that's one way to put it. I'm here. And I, mean, I mean, not just the new council, the council as a whole. You know, we, we have had a change, yeah. a flood, we've had a lot of things and we, you know, we're about to embark on this next stage. So we want to make sure, you know, this is, you know, we want to make sure we're all in this together. We're collectively, the seven of you and us and our team, we're all going to have to answer from these decisions. And we want to make sure people are comfortable and it's reflecting what the community's goals are. So, I mean, I think. Yeah, no, and I think like the that's... feedback and the questions are all great. It's just, it's not, I just wanted to make sure that us just giving that what feels like in some ways concrete and in some ways really vague and flexible advice is giving you enough direction to just keep things moving so that people doing rezoning actually know have enough guidance to do that so that we're not just back here rehashing things. I Correct. guess I guess that's and, the line I'm trying to And find. you know, that's always right, depending on when the rezoning gets done. You know, I mean who knows who will be sitting here and you know things that's part of the nature of working in the public. Um but you know I, I appreciate that and I think you know I want to be clear that just because you give us the go ahead, there's going to be a lot of check-in and a lot of updating and a lot of decisions to be made by this council as we go yeah. forward. It just means we we will start going down this list of doing things and which was, we haven't at all. We just kind of stopped um, waiting for this conversation. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe. Yeah, I think you may be muted, Joe. Sorry about that. Here Can we you go. hear me okay now? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. I just want to point out, I agree with uh, Carrie's point early on um, that a lot of the initial concept was done just on public input. And I think there really needs to be a dive down into actual needs for the community as far as housing and housing types and whether we use White and Burke or now outside consultants like Mike O'Brien who did the appraisal on the country club property. Um, I think that would probably be a logical thing as far as a, a, a potential next step. I also uh, agree with Tim that the cost of doing a secondary road is gonna be pretty expensive. Whether you come in off of East State Street through Sabins, the cost of the road itself is pretty substantial. And that's not a, including the cost of whether you do an easement or whether you do an outright buy of Zorzi and Goldman's uh, ownership interest in Sabins. So I think that's another thing we need to uh, factor in and I'm looking at page 20 of the uh, agenda packet that has some of these costs. And I believe that one of the uh, bonding things that they said is that we're gonna have to bond for another $16 million to bring up infrastructure, including um, new roads, new water sewer, new connector road. And I'm just wondering, you know, we've recently had this devastating flood Majority of our downtown commercial tax base has been devastated. So I'm not sure where the money's coming from. And I know that there's been proposals as far as TIF districts, but as far as I am aware of, there's been at least two failed TIF districts in the state. And I'm wondering how our TIF district is going to be a little bit different. So I just replied that those are all the you know, those are the questions that need to be asked before we before we proceed. You know, we need to figure out real costs and real revenues and what, you know, what, you know, are we going to sell the land, lease the land? Like, where does the money come from? Are we going to try to use TIF? Are we, you know, what would that generate? I mean, that's those are all the things we need would need to do before we uh, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure which other failed TIFs, most of them have been highly successful. And I think the question is, uh, you know, we've withdrawn ours right now, so we would have to reconstitute it. Uh, and part of the reason we withdrew it was basically thought it was too broad and we wanted to be able to target it to, you know, real project and not um, a proposed project. Uh, 
we have the authority to do a municipal only TIF so we could reallocate the municipal taxes from this project to this project. Uh, um, and then we could go for a statewide TIF where we also could allocate uh, funds. So, uh, excuse me, education funds, I short circuited there. Um, and we would have to analyze all of that. And as I said, right now, there's also a lot of state housing money and have talked to the state preliminarily about tapping some of that for this kind of project. And they said that was certainly um, something they want to continue talking about. But you're right, we can't make up money. We can't print money and we have to look at it in the terms of all of our needs. And, you know, well, is is there funds that are unique to this property that don't relate to the rest of our properties, right? If if this property and its improvements can pay for all the improvements and it doesn't downgrade our ability to fix other infrastructure elsewhere, we might want to consider it. If it's going to draw from other resources, then I think we have to view it differently. But again, yeah. that, these are all policy decisions the council has to make. We have to, you know, it's not up to me to say what we should or shouldn't do, but that's our plan is to is to make sure we've we've crunched all of that pretty carefully to make sure we're not going down a rabbit hole. And uh, another quick question. Um, I believe we're close to our bonding capacity. Am I correct, Bill? No, um, not just to, not to say you're wrong. Uh, we have, there's a bonding capacity and a bonding policy, a debt policy. So the statewide legal bonding capacity, the city has um, a whole lot of room um, that, so we're not anywhere close to our legal bonding capacity. We have a city council imposed debt policy that we are near the, the top two. Um, and I think one of the questions that we've wrestled with in the past is if we have a if we have a bond that is funded by itself, like the TIF bond, you know, how do we count for that? Because it's not really drawing from the general taxation, it's coming from a very specific set of revenues. So um, we would probably look to address the council policy to make sure we are following the general principles and the council can amend it, but I wouldn't say just amend it for the, you know, lift the limit. It would be a thoughtful amendment to account for a project like this if it was affordable. And one last question, Bill, uh, what's our bond rating right now? We don't have a bond rating. Uh, individual communities in Vermont, with the possible exception of Burlington, don't have bond ratings. We go through the municipal bond bank, which is a, consortium. So when, when municipalities pass a bond, none of us pass bonds big enough to really make a difference in the bonding market. So we work with uh, this the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank who pools all the municipal bonds from all the different towns and cities and puts them out to bid on the bond market. So it's a much larger sum of money. We can get more attractive rates. I don't, I'm looking at people in the room to see if they know what the bond bank's bond rating is but I don't know if we know it yet, but uh, so it would be whatever their rating is would be what, what ours is because it's through them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Sal and then Tim. Uh, well, I just, um, I just wanted to uh, agree that I, I think we, when we approve the, um, the actionable plan, we, um, we, we we kind of gave the okay to the big picture. Uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of detail that needs to be covered, and and others have mentioned just about all of it. Um, the word affordability appears in one place in item ten, and uh, I just want to make sure it doesn't get lost. It's on page twenty nine. Um, Housing is ex can be expensive unless we unless we make a special effort to make it affordable, and I I hope that that'll be uh, part of what we do. I I agree that we uh, also need to um, to figure out what what the housing needs actually are. I I agree with Donna and and many others about uh, single family probably not being a preferred style, but I think we ought to do our due diligence and figure out what we what the city actually requires. Um, and then two other things. I, I don't know how the um, analysis of the downtown with regard to any action taken uh, with respect to the river itself will affect um, our plans. But, um, you know, if we if we eliminate uh, some of the hardscape behind the state buildings off of State Street, uh, and and need to 
to replace it somehow downtown. Um, you know, those are decisions that are going to coincide with what we're doing here. And so we're, we're really undertaking, uh, not by choice, but by necessity, two fairly large uh, projects at once. And I'm, I'm wondering then, my, my second concern is what the um, feedback process will be, will be. Bill, you mentioned that there'd be a lot of coming back to the council with progress reports. And I just wonder if that's something that uh, you've thought about in uh, how that process would actually work. Um, we've thought about it in a couple of ways. I mean, I think we will probably schedule a regular, you know, at very least quarterly check in about what's going on. But I think what's really going to happen is, is things go forward. There's going to be, you know, we need X number of funds to do a study. So we have to put it in the budget, you know, you'll have to approve those kinds of things. We're going to need a decision zoning. Uh, you'll have to approve zoning changes. You'll have to approve an application for a growth center. You'll have to approve, you know, a TIF plan. You'll have to, there's a lot of things that will need council action to move forward. Uh, and I think, um, it, it behooves city staff and the community for us to be doing it in concert with the public officials as, as much as possible when there are key decisions to be made. It's not not our place to you know to make them for you. It's our place to try to help you achieve what what you want to accomplish. And you know if that's this, then that's what we're going to try to do, or something like this. But we're also going to come to you if there's a change to this. You know maybe we do a housing study and it says. The only thing that's can sell is single family homes. You know, you should, you need to know that. And then you can make a decision that says, doesn't matter. We're still going to go ahead with what we go, but you know, it's, we have to provide you the information so you can make informed decisions along, along the way. I mean, this is a big project. We're going to be at it for a little while. And so, you, you know, we'll be, we'll be coming back a lot. I would imagine. Yeah. So I think kind of back to where Carrie started with the first comments, it's kind of, if we're looking big picture and I think, the guidance that I think you're seeking is going to be, how do we break this property? I've been clear that I don't like the plan Whitenberg came up with. And even with the three plans, they said it was really one plan with three options. I don't think they were very imaginative regardless. I think what we need to do is designate a housing portion. Um, we have to, I hopefully will make a decision. And maybe you don't agree with me, but to not position ourselves as the developer, get ourselves out of this place and everything we're saying tonight still sounds like we're the developer and that isn't it's a black hole for us i don't think we're equipped to do it we have no experience with this and it's a really challenging project i mean this is like a teenager wants a motorcycle and the first thing you give them is a high performance Ducati. you know th this is a this isn't the place to start uh, when you want to do your first project and to be able to produce housing that's affordable um, with the kind of overhead and infrastructure needs for this project is more than a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I think something to be aware of, I think we've got to take the steps Bill just went through, you know, set it up, get the TIF, get all the right pieces in line, um, designate a housing portion, and then we can focus on the recreation pieces and the other issues that we need to develop as a community. And we can get back to our water system and our sewer system and our streets and our other priorities too. Uh, but I, I, I don't think, the, the track we're on where we're talking like we're going to do this, at least in my opinion, is the right way to go. And, you know, I, I would say um, to that, um, first of all, I get it. We aren't real estate developers and not, no. I don't think we want to be. Um, you know, one of the action steps is to identify partners. And I think that's one of that's where the city can, you know, we can because we own the land, because we can leverage infrastructure money through the various public processes, we can we can do some of what a developer might do without necessarily actually laying out selling houses. Do, you know, we can work in partnership to help create the kind of thing. But I really agree with you. Um, you know, I I, I don't want to be in the real estate business. No, but we also own the property, so we can kind of say this is what we'd like to see, and maybe put out our piece to developers and say this is our goal, and they would come back and say either that's feasible or that isn't, or here's, you know, but I mean, we, it's not just a zoning process. It's, it's, again, it's the land ownership. This is, we would like to sell or lease or give you the land or whatever it looks like to get this result. You tell us, you know, and have people come in and say, I can do 10 units like that, or I can do 200, you know, I, I agree with you. We shouldn't be the ones putting up the houses, but we can put up the, the means of getting houses in partnership. 
one person's view. Um, Kayla and then Barry. Uh, so is there any way to find out what will be the cost for city just like building this by ourselves or giving this to a private development companies i hope i'm using the right word uh, so can we learn like do can we have a chance to compare the cost for the city and res for its residents then maybe it will be easier for us to decide, oh, we want to build, we want to do this, or we can just tell the details what we want to see and someone else can build this for us. I think a uh, yeah, budget will be a very important item to decide which way we want to go. Like the less expensive, right? Oh, I, I think... I think there is a way to do that. We'd have to think about how we position that and it was something we'd probably come back and talk to you about. I don't right off the top of my head. I think we could, I think there's a way we could do that. Like say, I don't know, but let me get back to you on that. I want to, but I do think we can come up with some different alternatives about, okay. I mean, we could probably estimate, let's put it this way. We could probably estimate what it would cost to build all the infrastructure. I don't think we'd be building the housing, mm -hmm. but roads, the water sewer, and all that stuff, and public stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, so then the question would be, is what, if, let's say we did that, what's the return from the taxable value and, or could we then get developers to invest, you know, pay back for some of that infrastructure? Or do we say, we, we have an estimate of the cost. We go to developers and say, this is what we want to see done. And then they say, well, what's your estimate of cost? And you know, then they can make a proposal to us based on what they know to be the cost. So I think there are ways we can do that. Um, and my hunch would be, and, and you know, I'm sitting next to one of the top real estate people around who knows way more that that that's all going to have an impact on what the cost of, of the final product is to the end user, right? And if they, the more the developer has to put up, the more they're going to have to charge for a house, I presume. And so if the city can, that's where our negotiation with a development agreement might come to play. If we want more affordability, we say, well, can we buy down some of these costs, maybe not for the whole project, for part of it, so that some of these units are perpetually affordable or something like that. Maybe a place to start would be to attribute value for different portions of the property. So what do we feel the value is of the recreation portions we're going to retain, right? Mm -hmm. And then what's left? I think when you really look at the numbers, Palin, in terms of what it's going to cost. There's a couple of issues. One is time. I mean, right. if this isn't even going to happen for two to three years till you know things actually can actually be constructed, um, it's really difficult today to get a sense of costs or what they will be at that point. I mean, look at Burlington High School now in the news. Yeah. You know, it started at $165 million not too long ago, and it broke 209 today with estimates, and they haven't even started the building. Um, you're in that kind of an environment, so it's it's really hard to frame it in with good numbers. Um, but I do think if you just do big picture numbers the way I've done them, there's no question that selling it is our best opportunity and, and selling the building site off is the one I would, I wouldn't get into leasing it, just get a clean sale and through zoning and our other processes we have, we can control what happens on it. Perry. Uh, so one of the things I like about this actionable master plan is all the recommendations for next steps that come along. And so many of the things that have come up in this conversation, people saying, we need this, we need to learn more about that. We need that are addressed in these next steps. So if we follow this plan and we do these things, we'll get a lot of those answers, including a housing needs assessment is in there. And um, so I, I like the idea of saying, these are the sections that we think should have housing on them. And, um, you know, not getting too specific about exactly what kind of housing or how many, but that, you know, trusting that that will come out as we learn more and do these next steps and then really authorize the staff to move on with this plan and form these working groups and do this research and take these next steps. So is that a motion to direct the staff to uh, continue <laughs> on the path of uh, implementing the actionable master plan? Um, yeah, the only reason I'm hesitating is because it is sort of specific about how many units and exactly what kind of housing. And I would like to stay more flexible than that. Mm -hmm. So 
I think my motion would be to direct the staff to continue with the planning of the actionable master plan without uh, strict adherence to the number of units and the exact type of units. Are you getting ready to second that? Is there a second? I can second that. Okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So I guess just trying to understand and maybe Tim has an answer to this. Are there parts of the plan that there's a lot of steps identified where if we were to go the route of exploring selling for development that the city would not need to do, or would all of that be best done by the city anyway? I guess I'm just, if, I mean, it seems like at some point a developer is going to come in. So I just, so I just want to make sure we're being efficient with our resources and keeping mm -hmm. things moving quickly. Well, also wanting to make sure that we're, you know, as a public land, you know, defining the public good that we wanted to come, why we purchased it, which I think we could do through a really well-crafted RFP to a developer or, you know, like that kind of thing. But I just, are, is there duplication being done if the city is pursuing or, you know, would the housing assessment be done by the developer anyway? And so we could get them to do some of that work. Um, I think so. Because there's a certain amount of art to this. It's not, right. you know, and, and, and the developer is the artist and you have to leave them some latitude to want to do the project. Um, and I think there's a lot of basic pieces to it that like the single family house thing, when you think about it, what it costs to build a street, especially if we build city street, which we would probably have to do if it was us, but the cost to build the street to get from one house to another, if, if you had just a hundred feet of road frontage, your whole lot cost at today's lot values of Montpelier would go to just building the street. There'd be no return on the land or other aspects. So nobody will do that. That's why it makes more sense to build multifamily buildings in a more dense situation where you have less infrastructure to service them. But the single family, that's why you're really nuts. Yeah. 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 No, I know. I think that's reality. So you were agreeing. Yeah. yeah. No, but, but I, I think it's okay to make that statement, even if, right. if it is sort of a directive. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, the directive is for our staff. And then once we bring in, whether that's a nonprofit housing person, another developer, then mm -hmm. that's a partnership and they're going to apply their expertise to it. Exactly. And they're going to learn a whole bunch more. Mm -hmm. But when I read the tier one, two, three action plan on 106, it seems to me that those are all applicable without limiting any specific vision. We need to do those things. So, and that's why I supported the first and second motion there that Carrie made because I think it's there. I think we just need to give the, the staff the green light to do it. And as they come back, we consider everything that they bring back to us. And, and Tim, the way you're, I don't see the conversation the same way you're seeing it. I don't see the conversation as being everybody thinking the city is going to be the developer. I think the conversation is mostly about what we would like to see on this land. And Who's going to develop it? Probably not going to be the city. We don't, you know, we've had, uh, well, you know, the city has a, a history of funding or partially funding other housing projects around the city, mostly downtown. And we didn't, we didn't do, we weren't the developer. We didn't build it. We had uh, other entities like partnered with nonprofits to make it happen. And that's, whether some of this is done with a partnership with uh, with Downstreet or some other nonprofit, some of it is done by profit-making developers. That's the reality. I, that's what I see happening. Uh, Joe, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, no, I just wanted to echo my support for Tim Heaney's idea. Obviously, he has a wealth of experience. Um, I've got a lot of experience. I've been a real estate appraiser since the late 80s. I still work as a real estate appraiser. I honestly think that, you know, a, it's such a complicated project. And some of the stuff that we're taking on and we're asking people to decide, it's way beyond our capacity or way beyond what we should be doing as a city. I think that a developer who does this stuff day in and day out, they're going to know if we set certain parameters as far as how much recreation we'd like to set aside and say, here's what we're generally thinking of, 
and you come up with something workable and then come back to us to weigh in on, I think that would be a, a, a way that I'd like to see us go. Okay, thanks. Um, are we ready to vote on the motion? Any council members who yet need to be heard? I just want to check it. Have, have I missed anything or misspoken anything? I was just checking in with the planning department because I've been yapping and I want to make sure. Yeah, I mean, I think largely um, throughout the whole process, we've been pretty consistent in saying that it's just a conceptual site plan. The developer who eventually builds it will tell us what can go there. Um, and so, because they are the professionals, um, I think it's important to that we figured out the massing, you know, the community told us they wanted multifamily structures on the Southern part of the, the, the site, right? Um, and then no single families for the most part and duplexes, triplexes throughout. So I think, you know, thinking about first phase multifamily structures, when we go and do that RFP to developers, we'll, we will end up saying like, this is what we've done through our master planning process. This is the lot that we have that you, that you might have access to. What do you propose as being the best use of this size lot? How many units can you do? And by the way, um, we would like a certain percentage of affordability in those units. What does that mean? How many units can you do then? So it's it's sort of a back and forth. They're definitely the developers definitely going to be the one to, to be driving what ends up going there. They are the professionals. But I think you know this gives us the massing, we weren't gonna put multifamily structures on the on the Western edge, that would be ridiculous. Um, the community, community didn't want that. So with this, it gives us a, a guide um, and with FEMA's help, the infrastructure cost is reduced for that first phase of development, uh, which will then bring the actual investment for the city extremely low on a per unit basis, uh, which might then mean the rest of the development looks a little bit better financially to have more conversations about it. So I, I just would reiterate those points. So I think we're all, all, you're all correct in that the developer should be the one deciding what goes there. And that has been our intention all, all along. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Uh, Sal. Well, I'm just wondering if, um, I mean, Jim, you mentioned that you, you don't, you know, you didn't like White and Burke's plan that we should really just be defining where housing goes and where recreation goes. And if you if you take away all the little orange rectangles, that's what Plan A does, isn't it? I mean, what what are you um, are are you saying that? Uh, I mean, it seems to me the developer ought to decide where multifamily makes sense and and you know it should where there should be or should not be townhouses and so on. Um, and as I understand it, that that would still be possible if we were to proceed with this actionable plan. Does do you not do you not agree with that? Yeah, it's possible. I mean this layout wasn't set up for phasing as well as some other earlier options. Um, but Seth Whitenberg or the committee, whoever came up with this last version went with this i you know it seemed like if we were going to end up with potentially more than one developer to partner with this isn't the best layout to be able to break it up and say okay downstreet this is your section and we'll sell you this piece and i don't know whoever Farrell, redstone somebody else this you know you'll do this here this doesn't make that as easy but those are still conversations we can have because this isn't set in concrete mm -hmm. right yeah, I think the, the phasing is is mentioned as an item that you know needs to be settled. That that it isn't it isn't settled yet. You know, it's part of, it's part of this next step. Um, okay, let's vote. Oh, uh, sorry, Lauren. No, just it, it's come up a little bit, but just underscoring. I know that you're very aware, but. Just want to make sure that we are front loading the conversations about potential state dollars or federal state dollars that could go to this because I mean there's some pretty tight timelines on when money needs to be committed for um, ARPA funds and other things where there was housing money set aside in significant ways. So like if there's things that we need to be doing or that we'd be able to take advantage of if we did it in certain ways or moved on certain timelines and stuff, like obviously just it, 
I would love for us to be taking as much advantage of um, state federal funds as we can. So like it's, I see on tier two is the exploratory conversations. Like, I mean, I think I assume soon we're talking to VHCB, we're talking about like the other people that have been getting that money and like, how do we make this work to take as much advantage as possible? Um, so that might bump it in the order to hire to make sure that we're doing the other steps in a way to maximize that. Great point. I mean, one last point before we go, this is not contrary to anything else, but I do want to say out loud that I, I think I agree with it, all, everything and that we have a lot of flexibility. I will say that we have may have already set the stage for the multi-family housing at the beginning with the FEMA decision. I just want to sort of say that out loud that because of the, the clustering of the things and the idea that we might build work with downstreet or someone to build a building that I, I just want to make sure that we've acknowledged that we voted and that later on when this comes to happen, no one says, hey, we hadn't decided that that was a multifamily area. So I just, clarity is kind. Right. Uh, great point to make. No, everybody's eyes are open. All right. Are we ready to vote? Can you state the emotion? <laughs> I have but, strangely written up last year, which I think was a horrible misspelling of planning. So um, this may be off by a word, but to direct staff to continue the planning of the actionable master plan without strict adherence to the number of units and the exact nature of units. Yeah. Oh, there, right? So that must be planning. It looks like packing on my word, <laughs> but I'm going to change that now. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank Great. You. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, that's very good to have that part done. And it is now time for our break. 10 minutes, which gets us to about 8.35. Okay. Um, I think we're all back. You're welcome. I Again, I apologize for last time. But, uh, all right. Uh, moving along, we're. I think we've knocked off the biggest two elements of this uh, checklist, and I think we're down to the recreation plan. So this one should not require as much discussion, of course, unless you want to. It's simply, you know, now that we've established the rec area, um, it would be sort of get the head nod from you folks to begin at the beginning for what might go there, including the facility, what else would go there. And it would be, I don't know if it would be quite as extensive as the community process we did before, but there certainly would be community outreach, probably some survey, you know, I don't know. Does anybody want to speak to what our thoughts are for that? Or are we all good? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the brains of the outfit back there, they're telling me what to say. Um, so anyway, that, I think it's just, it's kind of the same thing. We put this stuff kind of on hold because of the flood and because of waiting. This. So if it's a go to proceed. Sure. Okay. So I'm, I'm taking what it says in your memo at its word, which is this item will be on a future. Oh, agenda. there you go. Even better. And no staff recommendation and no action needed until future agenda. And so what I, well, what I'm reading here, it sounds like there's some planning and studying going on. Yep. And we don't know what the outcome of that is yet. And we should wait and hear okay. rather than just like. Yeah, I think I think we changed our minds after I wrote this, but you're right. Okay. That's well, fine. If, if no, no, I think I think it's good. Fine. As long as we know, as long as we're saying this out loud that we are going to continue active planning and nobody's against it. We've covered that agenda. It's it's on the list. And Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Great. And Donna, your camera's still off, by the way. Your camera's still off. Your camera. Your camera on your laptop. Oh. Hey, um, beautiful. That was easy. Yeah. Wish they were all like that. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, uses for the building. So, um, basically, as, as I outlined at the beginning, we have our building. We're obviously using it for the shelter for this winter. Um, and I think there's there are some thoughts about ways it could be used uh, now or in the near future, next summer or whatever. Um, we've got a couple unsolicited proposals, you know, one from the hub, one from a daycare center. 
And I think, um, so there's a couple of questions. Do we want to consider uh, leases now that might involve fit up when we don't know the future of the building? And if so, what process do we want to do with that? So those are the two central questions, really. Mm -hmm. I would say, I think our, our suggestion is, this was always said, we're going to complete a process to decide what the future of this is. We ought to continue doing that. But on the other hand, there's something we said for having something stable there and having some rent. So it's really, I think we're seeking your direction as a policy matter on this. And given the uh, the two current uses in the building now, the child care center and uh, the shelter for, with Good Samaritan Haven, obviously they're not in there yet, but they're about to be. Does that fully occupy the building for the current uh, for the no, upcoming winter? It, no, it doesn't. And the the current daycare center that's in there is planning to move out at some point. Um, they're building a new facility and they're they're on a month to month lease. So their plan is to move out as soon as that's ready. They don't know sometime this winter, they think. So uh, that's their plan. And then the the um, shelter is really from November to spring. Um, it's, it, you know, I think we all have agreed that that's not the ideal location for a shelter. I mean, mm -hmm. the space is good right. for now. Um, the downtown locations are precluded. If it works and we want to continue it for another year, we could consider that. But at this point, the plan is to not have them be there. We do have some building issues, uh, some mold that we're remediating now in advance of that and would need to take care of before any other tenants came in. But that's happening already. Um, so I think it's really more conceptually, what do we want to do for now? Um, we do have a building that largely is being used off the and, and what's left of the building? Like how much space it, would you say is available for other things? Space and functional uh, right. elements. Uh, square feet. Yeah. The whole building is 15,600 square feet. Uh, the space that the shelter will occupy is about 2,000 square feet. And then the existing child care is, is about 2,000, 2,500 square feet. So that'll, you know, that'll leave about 10,000 roughly. Okay. But it's not contiguous necessarily. Right, right. So in terms of desired, like the, the there's one section where the shelter is going to use part of it, you know, together it would be, I think that's the area that the, the daycare center wanted was that whole area. Um, yeah, yeah the, the child care um, center pro the pro proposal that we have would in essence use about 12,000 of the entire right. facility. Right. And so they would occupy the better part of the building, but they also, I can't, we haven't talked to them specifically because we haven't really got into that, but I can't imagine they would want to come in fit up the whole place for a child care center for a two-year lease or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, you know, back when we negotiated with the hub about a year or two ago, that was part of it. They wanted to put a lot of investment in the building and with no assurance that it was necessarily going to stay. And so I think that's a challenge for anybody going in is what what's going to happen. What's the future? Is that building going to be reused? Is part of the whole? Is it going to be torn down in, in favor of a big new facility? I think those are just all questions that we will be talking about as we go forward in red. And we still don't know. And we still don't know. So you know, we have been, you know, we've been entertaining short-term leases that people need it, like the shelter and those kind of things to get some revenue. And that was consistent with the direction you had provided was if we can get some kind of, if someone needs it for storage for a period of time or something like that. Um, but we have not really sought longer term leases, but we received proposals from two. So Lauren. One point I have is is there opportunity given that the city staff, I mean I know probably many of us have heard from the senior center to do to you to, to meet other city needs, like yep. senior activities that could be held there um, because we're using up space. We are so I would, all of that. Yes. So I mean I would prioritize I think that and I think just big picture if we were going to pursue leases, um, I I would think things that did not involve big construction and commitments, it would certainly be open to short-term things that could bring in some revenue if we're meeting city needs um, and things in line with our 
strategic plan. Like, I mean, I think childcare has been on there. Um, the shelter has been on there. Um, so kind of urgent community needs like that. Um, but I think like open RFP process seems like good practice um, in general. So there's some initial feedback. If we were to do that. If we were, That's yeah, if we, if we were going to go in that and do some basic, right. I would want to open it up. Anybody else? Just curious for clarification. We're saying long term, short term. What are you, what are you thinking here? If you say people want long term lease, what are they asking about? So, um, when I think long term, I'm thinking something more than a couple of years. Something that that would require a, a, a per, a, an entity to come in and have to, you know, that would want to change things around, like a, a child care center, you know, 12,000 square feet, I'm sure they're not going to want to use the office space the way it is. They're going to want to create classrooms and kid-friendly spaces and all that kind of thing, and then, you know, put a sizable amount of investment. And I know when when we talked to the hub, it was 180,000 you were talking about putting in more than that, right? A couple of years ago. Do you remember that? Something in the ballpark. Yeah. And so, you know, they wanted to invest a lot of money, and it's like, okay, but you're only going to have it for, we can only commit for two years. So, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense for anyone to do that. So I don't, I don't want to string someone along and say, you can come in here and you can do all this thing. But, um, so I think it's really, what is the proposal? Whereas, you know, as it, as it's structured now, the, the shelter can operate without making any real big changes. We can use space, um, for senior activities without making big changes. Um, and those kind of things. So I think that's, you know, it, it, so I think if we were to say, yes, we're going to open it up for these proposals, then I think what we would be saying is, you know, for an extended period of time, we're not doing anything with that building. We're going to lease it for 10 years or 12 years, or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we're leaving it as is with whatever goes in there. And so it would be, I think that's the policy direction we're seeking. You know, the, the prior direction of end short-term leases only wait till the end of the process and that's still what the staff's recommending is, is to continue with that. But we also, you know, we want to get back to people that have given us proposals and with a good answer. You know, we, want to, we don't want to presume again to speak for mm -hmm. so. Donna. We're going to need little bits of revenue as well as big bits. But if we don't, then I really want to see the city use it. The city talked about using it, but it hasn't. And so it's just set there empty. So I would just, I would like us to really commit to do it if we're not going to lease it. So what would that be, Don, or Carrie? Um, so I, I feel like it's a little premature to talk about leasing it for longer term uses that would involve renovation and real commitment. I think we're not we're not quite done enough with our planning process around the recreational use, particularly. I am interested in shorter term things and I'm also interested in the city using it. Um, and if there were, you know, um, a childcare program that wanted to occupy the current childcare program space, so it didn't involve a lot of renovation and they, and they were willing to do a two year lease or something right. like that, then, um, if we are going to consider, though, issuing leases like that, then we got to go through a public process. There's got to be bids and, and great, yeah. And then I hope we soon get to the point where we can entertain proposals for the longer term, right. renovate the building. But I don't think we're quite there yet. No, because again, depending, I mean. The building has some positives, but also has some negatives. And, you know, it might be that the better use of that space would be to take that building down, build a new center, maybe with housing on top. Or, you know, if we want great things, then, you know, so we can't rule that out. So it's interesting because the Black River Report, Black River Design Report, sounds like it's they assess it as being a good solid building. It is. But, but not necessarily one that's compatible with probably what we want for our recreation. That's the same. And so the question is, you know, we could try to figure out a way to incorporate it in, you know, but I think we're not there yet. That's yeah. the um, I think we all got a letter from Jean Olson uh, about the senior center and having the office staff there. 
So it, has that been a consideration as you look at it, is whether or not some of the staff that isn't able yet to move back where they were being located. At We're there. looking at all those options, um, you know, and or and or holding some of the senior programs there where there's parking and those kind of things and people can come. Those are definitely all on the table. Um, yeah. Anybody else have anything to say about this? I think this is where we are. We I don't think we need to have a motion or a vote, but. That's the snapshot of what people are thinking. I mean, that was the council policy before. So as long as we're not changing it, I guess, then that's fine. Nick, you came out for this. Did you want to be heard on this? Or are you mostly listening? No, I'll we'll wait for that report that you're waiting for for the recreation mm -hmm. discussion. Okay, great. You What's the uh, anticipated time frame on that? This is the same uh, $20,000 study that the council approved. Correct. In so we, we have a draft report. We're expecting to finalize it shortly. Um, and that really is assessing an actual facility, what different sizes, what kind of revenues it might generate, what operating costs it might have. It's not really talked about the whole, but it would inform at least that part of the conversation and we had a lot of questions about it so we're seeking clarification from them before they get a final report so okay moving on to the last part of this item the use of the land during the project uh process yeah from now on <laughs> from now on well yeah starting now <laughs> while the project's being developed and then who knows right. what happens after yeah, I think, and with, so again, just to tee that up, you know, obviously we had that request, you know, we've been pretty much hands off on the use of that project. Uh, we've, you know, had the, the rec facilities, the, the, the fields being used, there's been skiing, there's been walking. It's it's really had been great multi-use area, actually, a lot of people walking dogs. Uh, but with, you know, there's been, we, council has approved hunt, hunting, I think with a residential project coming in, probably rather quickly, um, the combination of that plus being caught by surprise by what on, in theory sounded okay, cool, a concert in this big open space, but when you are sort of thinking about the roads and the facilities and the bathrooms and all those kind of things, it really didn't make sense. And so I, it, it caused us to think we should probably have a discussion with the council about what you think are sort of good uses. This doesn't have to be an all-inclusive list, but just get... And then we'll draft a policy and a procedure if people want to do something out of the norm or ask for permission or whatever, you know, because we're not going to think of everything. Someone's going to come up with a great idea. And, um, but just thought, you, you know, we had nothing in place when they came to ask us about the concert to say, here's a basis for granting this or not granting it or anything else. And so we should, we should be prepared for that. And we've heard from the cross country ski coaches saying, Hey, what about us? Yep. Yep. And we were setting up a meeting with them to look at, you know, I mean, if there's a, how they could reroute their trails, their course, you know, around the FEMA area. And you know, the rest of it's still going to be open. And so I think, I think there's a lot of land there. How quickly things get established. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, but that's okay. I mean, it's, it's glad to have, you know, it's good. It's great that it's getting four season use. And uh, and they were very amenable to it. They just wanted to make sure they knew what areas were. Yeah. So I think it'll be come out fine. So. So we, we, Mr. Donna, we should, well, oh, go ahead. Should, this is just what do you all think would be. Should us or should it be like the Parks Commission or someone? In all of the above. I think what we, we're just trying to get a sense of what you think are in and out. We'll run it past the Parks Commission. We'll, you know, rec folks. And then we'll come back and say, here's a recommendation. We just want to start the conversation. Maybe you don't want to have it here. That's fine. We just wanted to make sure you were aware this was happening and get your thoughts on it. Uh, so it's an open-ended question. Not one with a. Mm -hmm. action required so no, no. Well, the speed team and probably the running cross the country team they also use that land and they have never had any conflict with the hunters that have been there 
I don't know exactly even what the season is for hunting. Sorry, how soon it starts. Um, but that's been going on and coexisting. But when we get all that construction going on, is that going to be more intrusive? Well, that and people living there, I think, is a yeah. big difference. And there is there is a one of our city ordinances has a restriction about shipping within so many feet of a residential unit. And so it may just be that that be precluded. I have to go and see exact distances. You see the signs go up at the city limits every year. No rifle shooting, buckshot only. Buckshot only, man. We may be the only. Maybe we may be the only capital city that has that at their at our city limits. Um. So, what do you think? What? Go ahead, Karen. Um, so, I I think we're probably in a pretty good in a pretty good place already. Um, especially hearing that if there's an ordinance about not hunting within a certain number of feet of of residences, then I think that's pretty well taken care of. So, there may be parts of the property that people can still hunt on, and I don't. It, it, I haven't heard anything to make me think we shouldn't keep allowing that. We've been doing it. Yeah, so I think that's fine. Um, and then, and then your your recommendation is that we discuss uses we find accessible, ex acceptable, and compatible with the community vision, and direct staff to create a policy. So I think that this this plan, this master plan, does a really good job of laying out community vision, and so. Um, and then I also think that the, so I think you have some standards by which to go if somebody comes to you and wants to do something there. And then the other piece is that when this concert wanted to happen there, there were a lot of public safety concerns and logistical concerns. And that, I think that's always a basis for the city to say, no, we can't do that because we don't have the structure to support that. And I think it worked. I mean, it may have been, may have felt confusing from the inside and, you know, we're not really sure what to do here, but the outcome worked right and i think you know could the policy could just be something that you know as i'm thinking about what you're saying i'm just reflecting it could just be we would consider certain events but the city reserves the right to deny the event on basis of public safe, safety mm -hmm. period so i mean it's just so that's already established so we don't have to like come to the council and say you know is this okay or whatever you say what it's you know, you have 50 people and you want to have a campfire and sing around the camp. Well, not a campfire, but you know what I mean? You want to have, that's okay. You want to have 5,000 people? No. Yeah. So, okay. We'll, we'll put something together. Maybe yeah. that's the easiest. We'll give you something to react to. Yeah, I think, of, you know, public safety is one thing. Uh, impact on the property, on the property and on uh, other users and people living there is another one. Since there will be people living there, but other than that, I'm happy with him being as wide open as as we can, because people are using the land, and I think it's great. There's that one guy who said he on Channel Three said he was out there golfing every day. And Jim Sheridan's brother. That okay, lost the course every day. All right, good green seats. Happy with that? Okay. Thank you. Yes. We'll make that work. Moving to item nine, staff appreciation. So that was um, supposed to be taken off. Not that not that we don't want to appreciate the staff. <laughs> In fact, it's, it isn't it isn't actually on mine. Oh, it's, it's on mine. But yeah, it's, it's not a uh, not we just didn't have a firm plan yet of what to suggest to you. But we, we you know, certainly I'll take this opportunity again as uh, you know, we want to recognize city staff that really did a lot in, uh, in in terms of the flood and all their work and everything. So uh, we didn't take it off because we don't want to do it, but we, we wanted to bring something to you to suggest that you do or, you know, so okay. more to come on that. That will show up again. Great, because we had that thing that we we're calling the above and beyond yep. board, and it seems like the whole staff. Right. Yeah, this is you know, going to want to single beyond. individuals out, but um, certainly many people did a, a lot of great things, and we appreciate them greatly. Um, but 
you know, we'd like the, the public to have a chance to recognize them as well uh, somehow, but we want to think of what that looks like. So, All right. Um, more to come on that. More to come. I don't think we have any other business. City Council reports. Go and start at your end. Um, well, I've been gone for about two weeks to Alaska. I went to a Rotary conference dealing with climate change. And Alaska has the very same problems we have. Plus, glaciers are melting at an unprecedented rate. So you have the glacier melt that makes the water murky. And all the fish leave all the rivers that get the glacier melt because they can't breathe in it. The silk is so solid. Uh, it, so it was amazing to be there and look at the projects the local people were doing, especially the native Alaskans, to counter that impact. It's just very impressive. Also very sad. No reports. Sal. So. Oh, you're muted, Sal. Sorry. Still. Uh, I, I have no reports. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, very good. Thank you, Tim. Um, I guess it's reporting, we're so happy to see stores opening downtown and yes. um, the activity levels picking up and people have been coming in supporting them, which is really wonderful. Yep. More to come real soon. Yeah. Uh, Alan. No report for tonight. Okay. Lauren. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for the ongoing participation in the resilience conversations. I mean, it was great to see yet again hundreds of people turn out uh, between online and in the building. Um, and yeah, I think some great ideas and um, there is the open applications for the commission uh, to keep moving that work forward Do tomorrow, just a single paragraph um, expressing why you want to, to do it. So just encourage folks, if you've got uh, energy and enthusiasm and ideas, uh, please throw your hat in the ring. We need some good people to to step up. Can you, can you um, just say again how people can find that and how they can do that if they want to? Maybe if someone... people are interested in, I can tell you the short answer. If you want to send in an application, you send it to our office to msmith at montpelier-vt.org. And it's basically, uh, this is why I want to help serve that. Um, I don't have the actual description of what it is, but it's basically to deal with the flood resilience, a commission to look at all the different uh, priority topics that uh, were raised through the process. But M. Smith, that's Mary Smith, M. Smith at Montpelier-VT.org. And since I was going to save this for my bit, we have 12 applications so far received as of one. All right. All right. My report is pretty brief. I thank everybody for your uh for coming out to these uh to the community forums that we had we uh, had a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm a lot of great ideas and uh, i'm hoping that that energy continues uh, please do we we've started already with establishing the uh commission for the future and i hope we get uh, some very good applicants and uh, we've got a long way to go and so this 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 is really just the beginning, but uh, I'm glad I'm glad we are already uh, already rolling. And I think that's all. I also go go out and shop downtown. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, clerk's report. Yeah. So just a, a couple things. Um, I got the finally have the final number of. Um, the assessment appeals that the Board of Civil Authority will have to hear. It's 69. Now that's, that's a big number. I'm hoping that a sizable chunk of those, even maybe almost a third, can be actually dealt with pretty quickly and easily. I'm hoping so, no promises. Um, our first meeting is gonna be next week, the 21st, Thursday. They'll all be at the Senior Center. We may have to move between one or two different rooms, depending on whether it's the first um, 
first Thursday of the month, which is when the community jam likes to be in there. So um, there will be a little bit of musical accompaniment once a month, but um, we may have to be in a slightly smaller room to block it out, but it should be enough space to to accommodate us. So it shouldn't be a problem. These are not going to be hybrid meetings. That was the, the, the sort of majority of the group that they would be um, all in-person meetings. So it's very important for not just for folks to 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 come because we're down so much on the number of the board of civil authority and unless i hear otherwise from our attorney the the uh quorum is still going to be eight um due to a quirk of our charter which i i regret um not so stepping in state law. under the state law quorum is three no matter for the bca for bca yeah. no matter what the size of the town no matter anything interesting yeah yeah I for every other legal group state law says it's a majority of the members even if there's vacancies yeah no not not with not with this one yeah. they had they had these problems in mind and yeah. Montpelier went their own way <laughs> but the problem is going to be then just so you all know and i don't want to drone on too long but an initial hearing will happen a uh committee uh an inspection committee of three people will be made to that will go out and inspect the property in question come back and return a report possibly a recommendation to the greater body but then the only folks who can vote on that final decision are ones who were there initially and witnessed that first period when there was testimony now it looks like we can record these things so if you want to show up and vote you can listen to the recording and do that it that way. The LCT seem to be okay with that, but it is kind of complicated. And it does mean, you know, if you're going to come to one, at the very least, if you could try to plan to come back for the one where that inspection committee will be returning its report so the Jing can vote on that. But it's going to be tough. We're down so far on the, the members of the Board of Civil Authority. The numbers are down so much. It's going to be really tough to get quorums for this, but we'll, we'll slog for. Anyways, it sounds like a complicated process. Jack's been through it a million times. I've been through a couple smaller, just individual ones. Um, we'll make we'll make it all clear to you when you show up. If you don't know, it's sounds complicated. It's actually very straightforward, and they're going to they're going to get routine um, pretty quickly. And I want to jump in and mention, remind everybody here: if you're on the council. You are a member of the Board of Civil Authority. And the Board of Abatement. <laughs> yeah, so, so it is... Uh, I have mentioned it a couple times over the last few months. It, it's work, and fortunately, anyone who's on the council has already demonstrated that they have a capacity for hard work, so... Uh, it's so informative. It's just another piece of them. It, it's really a very community. It's personal. Very interesting uh, project to do, and uh, yeah, Tim. So, are there binders we're supposed to pick up? Yes. Well, we got the final uh, appeals in today, so the binders should be done by the end of the day tomorrow. And I will send you all um, electronic copies week to week to week of the ones we're going to be hearing next week. So rather than fold through the the binders are big as you might imagine. But I think we've got six lined up for Thursday, and I'll go ahead and send you those electronically, too, so you can you can look at them. Yeah, Lauren? So just the schedule. So it starts next Thursday, the 21st, and then every single Thursday. For, for, for the rest of the Yeah, so then the Board of Debatement. And I have real concern about this, because these could this could go well into election season, and that's going to make the, the bandwidth of my office be stretched possibly beyond the breaking point. Um, so I'm not sure what to do about that yet, but, but you'll see me look older, faster, <laughs> if nothing else. So you said some good information, and my understanding in reading it was that you have to go see every property. Is that correct? That and is not literally correct okay. because we're in the state of emergency. Technically, the board can vote to forego inspection. <laughs> this is unique that we're in an all hazards zone. But you can't make the inspection before the fiscal hearing. It's not like then you have to consider them twice. They present, you go visit, and then they, you say a decision. Well, I'll get you out our draft. I worked with Jack on a draft um, uh, procedure 
list and I'll get that out to you. I'll get that out tomorrow. I should have gotten that out earlier this week. And it lays out that the, you know, the real back and forth is in that first meeting. And then I guess there'll be an opportunity for folks to ask questions after the report is back, but it's not going to be starting a whole, you know, the, it's a quasi judicial hearing. So evidence is presented by one side, evidence is presented by the other. When the report comes back, there's usually an opportunity for a question or two, but there's no longer an opportunity to present new evidence or to make new arguments, just for clarification. If you're allowed the alternate decision to go visit before you actually take evidence, it, would that not reduce the amount of time of meeting? No, we do take the evidence before. The not visit, the visit. Well, the, you know, the other way around? First. Um, that's not how the law sets it up. Okay, that's what I thought. And then yeah. you said something about emergency, you didn't have to. Okay. Oh, no. Well, no. You, okay. you asked if, if we needed to always have an inspection committee. And under the, the emergency declaration, we could theoretically just hear the evidence, say there's going to be no inspection committee and we're going to make a decision here and now. But if you do do it, then you have to do it after. Yeah. Okay. Because it's the hearing at which the inspection committee for each property is appointed. So we hear the evidence about, uh, you know, one main street or whatever, and say, "Okay, who can who can do this? Me, you, and Carrie will be the committee for that for this property, and we'll make our arrangements for when we're going to go." Um, but I can tell you that I had a conversation with the attorney for one of the taxpayers, who has a whole bunch of them, and we talked about, well, maybe. An inspection isn't going to be necessary for those because that's not necessarily what the basis of his claim is going to do. And so that could save us some time. And so one of the nights we're we're taking up like all of those properties at once. I think a lot of that. There may be another similar bunch. Maybe we should do that, right? We usually do at a minimum, we usually do that at the last meeting. So yeah. The other thing I had, I, I never go on forever like this kind of reports, but, um, you know, I'm I, a little bit, I'm mostly back working out of City Hall now, but I have to go back and forth quite a bit to the Senior Center, uh, and I like to maintain a presence at the Senior Center, but it was down there long enough that I just think it's worth saying this is the whole process has, is really continues to stress staff out a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's hard on them, but everybody is working so hard and they're keeping their, their chins up. And I, I know it's been rough on some folks because I, I, I've heard some things, but they're doing a great job, but committed to continuing to do a great job. They're, you know, under unusual circumstances, people are kind of on top of each other over there, but, um, you know, just means there's, there's a lot of collaboration happening and a lot of supporting of each other happening and it's just it's just been an amazing thing to see and i just want to put that out there okay is it city managers uh, report i've got a few things um first of all the gold star goes to council member heaney for sending me a note asking me if we had warrants to sign tonight um, so he observed that we hadn't passed them around so they will be at the Police department tomorrow morning. This is one of our little adjustments to a new space. So we'll try to remember to bring them with us or just have them at the TV. So if you could. It sounds like there aren't any that are really critical. Right. So it's it's no no big rush. But I just didn't even occur to me. No, the same I know. Time. So. <laughs> right. What's that? The binders are going to be there too. Yeah. And the binders will pick up your BCA binders and sign the warrants. So. Yeah. Uh, at least four of you. So Grab thank you for that. Warrants. Heads up. Uh, we That was. Uh, so speaking of meetings, we have scheduled, um, thanks to all of you for your feedback, we've scheduled the um, strategic planning meeting for October 18th. We will have to find a new site that is a school board night, so they'll be in this room. Uh, so we'll have to find a new site. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. One, do you want to start a little early and have some food, or do you want to stick to 630? Uh, a little longer. Paul Costello will be facilitating that. Uh, if we start, when we, you know, we have a lot to get through, so eat and talk, and we'll find. So, is that how early is it? Like five thirty? That work for people? Okay. Yeah. So then, part two of that question is: so we'll get back to you with the location and details. 
Part two of that is normally our regular meeting would be on October 11th, which I know at least one person can yeah. make or could make remotely, but not for, it wouldn't, didn't work for strategic planning. So the question is, do you want to skip the 11th and have it be the 18th? Or do you want to have a business meeting on the 11th and only have the strategic planning on the 18th? Let's see what things look like after our next meeting. Okay. Um, all right, we'll do that. Um, so we do have some, you should, so the next meeting, uh, we'll be talking about Confluence Park amongst other things. Uh, and we'll give you an update maybe on what's happening with City Hall. And some, you're gonna have um, some heavy lifting really right from the time you do the, um, the strategic plan for next year. Somewhere in there, it's one of the reasons I want to know if you want to have an October 11th meeting or not. Somewhere in there that we'll be presenting to you a recommendation for how to deal with this year's budget with, with perceived shortfalls. And part of the variance is we don't even know what the abatement applications are yet. So we don't even know what the worst case scenario could be or how bad it is. So we're still trying to figure that out. But at some point we will calculate a budget a revenue gap, a revenue shortfall, and provide recommendations for how we would recommend closing that. And that will come to you for a discussion. Just for those of you that were here before, that's what we did with COVID. Um, and it'll be the same kind of thing. And the sooner we do it, the sooner it's in place for the rest of this yeah. fiscal year. So we can't let it wait too long, but we also don't have enough knowledge to know. That'll probably be sometime in October. Once you have the strategic plan, set your priorities, Shortly thereafter, we have a conversation with you about next year's budget, the FY25 budget, and what, how you see those priorities moving forward and what your thoughts are and what parameters you might want to put on as far as budget limits or tax rates or whatever, because then we will be starting in November with our own staff presentation to give you your budget in December. So going to be a lot of uh, thought processes coming up in October. So just enjoy your September. <laughs> and when you're not looking at assessments on the Board of Civil Authority. Still, as we're talking about uh, budgets, are we still on track to have a fiscal 2023? I believe so. Report for the yes, for the next meeting, which would be just one meeting later than normal. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. I'm checking with the boss back there. Yes. Yep. She's nodding. Uh, and then one other thing I didn't want to add it to tonight because we just discovered this so late. But um, you may recall that right after the flood, you issued me some authority to take actions with flood related, and that actually expired on August 23rd. So we might need to re up that. So um, you won't probably don't need a million dollars now, but it would be, uh, but there are still some FEMA related things. It would only be those kind of things to move along. So we might ask you to do a call in meeting sometime just to re up that. Should be the only agenda on the item for some more period of time at a lower level. So great, because we've been kind of operating as though it was still in place. So I, I missed that. Is that it? That's it. Okay, so we can adjourn at 9.22 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you.